Prakriti. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Going to try What's and the time there? It's uh, 10.30. 10.30 in? PM. PM, PM right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Attend as many <laughs> sessions as I can. Yeah. Well, I was scheduled for a meeting in Toronto a few days ago. And uh, my time was like 1.30 AM. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think... You can attend all meetings everywhere, but <laughs> you have to sleep at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nirmala. Hi, Prakash. Hey. <laughs> so good to have you both. Uh, so good to see you. Yeah. Today is just a crazy day here. Yeah. yeah. I have another series going on, so I'll be kind of on two devices. Oh my God. Good day. I know. God save you. <laughs> well, I was like, what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Zara, can we start? If ma'am is here, let's just check with ma'am. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You mean I? Hi. Hi, Shohini. <laughs> hi. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Am I allowed to come? Yes, ma'am, please. All right. Good morning, ma'am. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Ma we can start now. Good morning and welcome to all present. We at the Department of English, Zamia Milia Islamia, are delighted to welcome you all to the inauguration of the Ministry of Education Spark Supported International Conference. Just a second. I'm so sorry. My screen just vanished because of the YouTube. You're good. We can hear, see you. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll just redo this. Good morning and welcome to all present. We at Department of English, Jami Milia Islamia are, welcome, are delighted to welcome you all to the inauguration of the Ministry of Education Spark Supported International Conference on Confronting the Global, Exploring the Local, Digital Apprehensions of Poetics and Indian Literatures, organized by the Department of English, CMI, and Michigan State University. The Scheme for Promotion of Academic and Research Collaboration, um, SPARC, aims at improving the research ecosystem of India's higher education institutions by facilitating academic and research collaborations between Indian institutions and the best institutions in the world from selected nations to jointly solve problems of national and or international relevance. The scheme proposes to enable productive academic cooperation by supporting the critical components that can catalyze impact-making research. Today's conference is yet another effort by the department to enable this kind of cooperation and collaboration by aiming to channel the affordances of digital technologies to engage a generation of readers and participants, both within academia and beyond. And we are so glad to have you all with us on this journey. I now invite Professor Nishad Zaidi, Head, Department of English, Jamia, and Conference Chair to deliver the welcome address. On to you, ma'am. Thank you, Zaira. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar, uh, my colleagues from different universities of the world and from my own university, my dear students and participants of the conference. I extend a very warm welcome to you on the cold Delhi winter morning. Uh, in an increasingly digitally connected world, humanities can no longer afford to turn their back to digital humanities. And this conference, Confronting the Global, Exploring the Local, Digital Apprehensions of Poetics and Indian Literature, it is linked to a Ministry of Education Spark supported collaboration between Jamia Milia Islamia and Michigan State University. The aim of our project is to foreground the use of digital technologies such as minimal computing, novel right. research, DH research, and teaching methodologies, critical archive generation and maintenance, just to mention a few, uh, for explicating poetics of Indian literatures. Under this uh, project, uh, we began with a three-week course by Dr. Sean A. Pugh, 
who came to India in December, and everyone remembers December. He was here from 7th to 27th December or 28th December, if I remember correctly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sean A. Pugh, he's a renowned scholar in the field of digital humanities from Michigan uh, State University. And uh, he taught this course uh, to our students and also students from uh, both postgraduate as well as research scholars from different universities of India. Uh, and the course aimed at trying to bridge the gap between the shrinking significance of Indian poetics and growing digitization that is taking place nowadays. He also taught them about minimal computing and many other tools and technologies which are relevant in digital humanities, especially with reference to uh, non-anglophone literature, Indian literature in, to be specific. Uh, while talking about Sean's course, I must mention that uh, uh, some very unpleasant, unfortunate things happened during that time but hats off to Sean that he continued to teach without, uh, you know, uh, uh, without blinking an eyelid. He stayed put in the university guest house and finished his course. And I must appreciate my students who also, uh, you know, many of them were directly affected by the incident that took place, but still they continued to uh, attend the course. So the, uh, so the, the, the courage which they, which they uh, showed was absolutely exemplary. And um, that is what makes us, uh, you know, so proud of Jamia and the spirit of Jamia. This was uh, uh, then, then uh, on 16th, from 16th to 18th October, we had this three day virtual digital humanities workshop uh, in collaboration with IIT Indore and Dharti. Uh, the theme of the workshop was mapping digital humanities practices on uh, in and on India access tools and criticism. Uh, this workshop was also a kind of exposure uh, that uh, scholars from, of digital humanities from IIT Indore gave to our students in computational tools available to the scholars of digital humanities, uh, data types present in digital humanities, tools of digital archiving and so on and so forth. Finally, we had this, we organized this seven day, 27 hour international workshop from 12 to 18 December on theory and praxis of digital humanities in which scholars from India and abroad discuss subjects ranging from digital humanities in India, digital archiving to uh, artificial intelligence in Punjabi poetry and Hindi poetry, OCR in Islamic texts and digital archiving of non-anglophone texts and so on. In the process of organizing these lectures and workshops, we have managed to forge solidarities and create a community of young digital humanities, uh, human, humanists, and senior and practicing ones like Dr. Uh, Shavit Mukherjee from uh, CSSSC uh, Kolkata, Dr. Nirmala Menon, uh, and her amazing team uh, comprising uh, uh, Dr. Reema and Shan Murgapriya, Dr. Till Grellard uh, from Oriental Institute, Beirut, Dr. Maya Dodd, Padmini Re Mare, Sri Ganesh from Heidelberg, Wal Walter Hakala, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, people who have been so generous uh, and who have graciously agreed to extend support in all our future endeavors. It is on the strength of these assurances that we hope that this project will only be the beginning in our uh, um, journey towards digital humanities. We hope to include it in our curriculum by introducing a certificate course in digital humanities very soon so that we have um, uh, a, you know, a, a community of uh, uh, digital humanists uh, uh, coming out of Jamia um, because I feel that digital human humanities is very relevant for a place like Jamia. Uh, I'm delighted this conference is happening in the centenary year of the university. And as the year comes to a close, this is our last offering in the centenary to the centenary celebrations. So if we are able to dream big, remain firm in our resolve uh, and focus on building the future, the credit for this uh, uh, goes to mainly our vice chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar, who has led us through these difficult times and inspired us to continue uh, in our productive work uh, without uh, you know, being swayed by or being affected by any of the negativities around. So uh, uh, I invite Professor Najma Akhtar, who is an educationist herself and uh, a, a very able administrator and a very loving person. So uh, over to you, Professor Akhtar, for your inaugural address. I welcome you, ma'am, please. Thank you, Nishat, for giving me this opportunity and inviting me here uh, for this conference. 
Dr. Sean Pew, Linguistic and Germanic, Slavic, India, Asian and African Languages from Michigan State University. Professor Nishad Zaidi, Head Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Mr. Rumi Nakvi, Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. And uh, those I, whom I can see is Nirmala Menon. And uh, I haven't met you, but uh, you are there and looking very nice. And Shohini Ghosh, uh, Shohini Ghosh and uh, beautiful Zehra, who is, uh, who is conducting it very well. Uh, confronting the global, I, I wish you all a very good morning and a good evening in, to those who are away. Uh, is it night or evening? Anyway, uh, all my distinguished guests here and all the university professors who are with us and teachers and students and those who are with us and those who are, uh, who are away from India but par participating in this. I welcome you all. Confronting the global, exploring, confronting the global, exploring the local and digital apprehensions of poetic and Indian literature is an international conference that marks the academic exchange and scholarly collaborations between Jamia Millia Islamia New Delhi and Michigan State University, USA. On this wonderful occasion, we are honored and delighted to host the second MHRD sponsored Spark International Conference in Humanities and Social Science in our university. This online international conference is a result of the Spark project under the aegis of MHRD, which enabled productive academic cooperation by supporting critical and impact making research while giving an international platform for exchange of ideas and knowledge between the two universities. The experience as a result of the workshop conducted by Professor Sean uh, from Michigan State University has been enriching for our, very enriching for our students. This was uh, co-hosted by IIT Indore and then the recent week long workshop hosted by the Department of Education of English, examining and exploring digital humanities theories and practices, as well as digital literary cultures with workshop sessions and presentations from scholars of Indian literature, digital humanity practitioners and students. Today, we are extremely grateful and honored to host a diverse group of national and international academicians and uh, scholars from all over the world in this conference, which promises to be truly revolutionary in the field of digital humanities. And I'm uh, happy that this is starting from, the, from Jamia Millia Islamia. In an increasing digitally connected world, digital humanities as a field and as a repository of knowledge and tools become increasingly important every day even as literary forms and discourses become more and more enmeshed with the digital. This conference seeks to critically question the globalization and internationalization of digital knowledge production and while actively explore how localization of digital tools and technologies can be harnessed to annotate the Critically analyze, and, and critically analyze the poetics of digital text. A participative, collaborative endeavor in digital futurism and Indian poetics, this conference is a step in this direction. As I extend my warm welcome and heartful <coughs> welcome to all the delegates and participants presenting their uh, corpus of research, Spark's effort to bring together delegates from different countries is commendable. And it is also commendable that there are institutions uh, who are actively working on this. 
uh, on the spark uh, routine. So uh, it's not only uh, the program, the spark, but it's Jamia Vilya and the Michigan uh, State University, which is doing a lot of uh, good work. And the conference is an occasion to channel the uh, affordance of digital technologies to engage in discussions of mutual interest and concerns at an international level. And thanks to Corona, I must say, it has brought us still more closer. It's not a single person or two people visiting from a far, a far away university, but it is coming together of so many uh, national and international participants and people exchanging their views. So we have to find out the uh, silver lining in the dark cloud. Corona has given us something and we have taken it very gracefully and adapted to it. Thank you very much and have a good uh, conference and enjoy the, uh, the, uh, the December um, season of Delhi because it's cold, but it is sunny. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Akhtar, for your kind and inspiring words. I now invite Dr. Pew to deliver the intro to the theme of the conference. Passing the mic to you, Sean. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Well, it's, it's uh, amazing to to be here with all of you, and and thank you all uh, so much. This has been um, the this opportunity provided by the uh, MHRD for the for the. Uh, Spark has been a, been very been wonderful. It's it's been wonderful to get to know you and also to meet the other other Spark participants. I think things are really happening in terms of digital humanities in India right now, and it's really nice to see the ways in which you're you're collaborating and, and forming uh, forming relations with people in in uh, in different locations. I've gotten very excited in particular about the India Ocean Rim configuration that that's coming out of some of the the uh, earlier talks as well. And so I've been talking to um, uh, some other people uh, in uh, in that regard. Uh, so I I think that I think you, the you've all uh, articulated most of the topics that we'll be discussing. We what one of the other goals of the of this project was also to boost the digital humanities research capacity within within Jamia Millia and within uh, within other institutions and uh, I think that um, it's I, and I think that I've, I've, was, I've recently learned that often in uh, India you might may have to set your syllabi uh, forward for a number of years so you're kind of stuck with the same resources for, for three years and so I think a lot of people are are thinking about the the issues in terms of, of building digital humanities research capacity and I think we need to Think about ways of working together to develop uh, open educational resources that will also fulfill some other basic needs that uh, that India and uh, the U.S. in particular um, uh, share in, in terms of understanding uh, data literacy and you know, and uh, statistics and so on as well. So I, and uh, so I think that there's some um, I think the open educational resources and things that, that we can work together on is, the, is, is uh, probably the, the best way to go as far as that as far as that's concerned. Uh, and uh, in terms of the the program looks absolutely fantastic and you're and, uh, you're going to get see uh, for, uh, for those of you who are to new to this area see a lot of exciting uh, uh, research that's happening both in in, um, in forms of media that would often not be considered by the humanities and uh, and and using using techniques in the in the in the uh, to analyze humanities uh, information that you wouldn't you may not may not expect and so I think that it's that kind of interaction that we're um, uh, that we're seeing here um, and you know, yes I'm, I'm just skimming through the uh, the program again I think it's going to be it, it should be fantastic and we're looking forward to working with you and uh, hopefully uh, one of the we have a number of other digital humanities projects that we're hoping to, to uh, put forward through this conference. So we'll, we'll tell you more about those and hopefully we can all uh, work together um, um, to, um, to produce something that'll be, that'll be useful. And I, and I, I agree um, uh, the, that the coronavirus has really, um, has brought us together in new ways and made us think uh, even more, more um, thoughtfully about the, 
the care with which we have to we have to preserve our cultural heritage, and um, and 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 make sure that we don't uh, you know lose these vo lose the voices of people who are who are um, who are more vulnerable than ever, um, and so with with the virus and so on. So I, I hope that um, uh, this, that uh, we all get a chance to to talk more. We should have we should figure out a time to do tea. Um, preferably, maybe your evening time would be better. So <laughs> for me, so uh, so I have, have I'm going to probably skip out soon because it's 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 quite late here. But I have a have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so uh, excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. On behalf of the Department of English, it is an honor to get this opportunity to deliver the vote of thanks. First and foremost, we are highly grateful to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar, who has been a leading force behind our project in these challenging times. Thank you so much, ma'am, not only for taking out time this morning, but also for being here with us and providing your continuing support for the work the Department of English has been doing under your patronage. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would also like to thank the Ministry of Education Spark for supporting our project, as well as the Jamia administration whose support has made the organization of this conference possible. Thank you most importantly to all our invited speakers who have been so generous in agreeing to be here with us these two days, sharing their ideas and scholarship despite their busy schedules and time zone differences. Thank you also to our paper presenters today. It is a pleasure to host you. We are so grateful to all the chairs and rapporteurs who have been really kind to us by taking on these duties. Thank you to our PIs, Professor Zaidi, Professor Pew, and Mr. Rumi Nakwi, who have been a driving force behind this conference. Thank you also to everyone who has worked behind the scenes, our organizing committee, especially my partner, Astra, as well as our staff, and of course, all our friends at MSU. Without this team effort, a conference of this scale wouldn't have been possible, and we are so grateful. Thank you, and join us as we begin our first keynote session now. I hope everyone has a fantastic time with us. I now pass the mic to the rapporteurs for the first session, Rohan and Ankita. Do go ahead and open the keynote session. Thank you so much. Very warm welcome to all of you to the first session of our conference. Chairing this session is Professor Nishad Zaidi, whom we all know. She is the head of the Department of English at uh, Jamia Millia Islamia. She has to her credit more than two decades of research and training and several national and international uh, publications. Uh, Ma'am is also the PI on this project. Now I hand over the mic to Professor Zaidi to introduce the speakers, please. Thank you, Ankita. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure and indeed an honor to welcome the first keynote speaker of this session, uh, Professor Amardeep Singh. Uh, I was searching for digital humanities uh, scholars across the world, especially who are working in the area of Indian literature. And I came across this stupendous work of uh, Professor Amardeep Singh that was not known to be my sheer ignorance. Uh, of course, he has worked on, uh, uh, on film, the film of Mira Nair, Despora Verete, which was published by University Press of Mississippi in 2018, is one of his publications. Another uh, literary secularism, religion and modernity in 20th century, this is another book. Uh, but uh, uh, for me, the most interesting uh, uh, aspect of his uh, scholarly contribution uh, is the amount of digital archiving uh, work that he has uh, been engaged with. Uh, the early poems of Claude McKay, the Kiplings and India, women of early Harlem Renaissance. These are only some of the digital humanities projects that he has uh, worked on and has been continuously working on. When I uh, began to discuss his work with me, he also told me about the, his work about uh, you know colonial uh, uh, colonial records so so i find his work extremely fascinating a very warm welcome to you professor amardeep singh uh, for your keynote address um, okay hello thank you um, and thank you for having me here um, as the opening keynote for your conference i know that there were some uh, workshops uh, last week as well i think i, I heard a little bit about those um, and uh, I wanted to just make a quick prefatory comment, if you don't mind, before getting into the main um, substance of the talk. And I just wanted to say that, you know, though I'm based here in the US, I did watch the um, events in Delhi last year. And 
Um, it does seem like a lifetime ago to, <laughs> because so many things have happened since then. But I, I watched with awe at, at the bravery and resilience of the students at Jamia and other un the universities. I've been inspired by you all and I want to support you in any way I can. Um, I also hope that in subsequent years, um, after COVID-19 is behind us, that I can be with you in person and learn more about the work that you do at Jamia. Um, so I'll begin now and um, I'll, um, I will be sharing slides for a fair amount of my talk. So uh, hopefully um, uh, you'll be able to see them okay and we won't have any technical troubles. Um, I came to this project, uh, which is called Digitizing DeRosio uh, with some trepidation since Henry DeRosio is really a writer associated with the romantic period and I'm very much not a romanticist. Um, uh, so let me begin by giving two bits of explanatory context for my interest in working with Henry DeRosio and in producing a digital edition of his works. So at this point, I am gonna try and share my screen and I'll see if that works okay. Um, and I assume you all can see that okay? Yes, we Thumbs can. up? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, to begin with, let's see, why is it not forwarding the slide? Um, on one second. Hmm. Sorry. Okay, let's try it that way. Okay. To begin with, um, I've been interested in a phenomenon called the archive gap, by which I mean the disparity uh, between the extent and quality of digital archives for white, Euro-American and canonical writers and those in the colonial and post-colonial world. Um, the causes of the archive gap are many and began with decisions about which sorts of primary texts were preserved and which were discarded, especially under British colonialism. The gap in preservation means there's a much better British record of key historical events like the 1857 uh, rebellion or mutiny than there is of the Indian side. One sees a similar discrepancy when it comes to the preservation of materials in South Asian languages, especially in 19th century newspapers. Nearly perfect records exist of many English language newspapers published in places like Kolkata, Lucknow, Allahabad, and Lahore throughout much of the 19th century. By contrast, the preservation of newspapers printed in Bengali, Urdu, or Punjabi was much more spotty. A second phase in the archive gap um, is one where uh, materials that were preserved have been acquired by research libraries. And which of those collections that were, ca uh, were cataloged and were made um, uh, accessible to users? And then later as companies, uh, more recently, I guess, as companies like Google have started digitizing materials from these libraries on a mass scale uh, in the early 2000s, they also made decisions about which materials to prioritize. And then finally, I think the, the issue that we deal with today, uh, we contend with now, is um, the one that involves uh, digital humanists, um, which, which materials are scholars deciding to invest their time and energy in. Um, with respect to uh, Euro-American writers, there are impressive digital archives, often with significant grant funding and sizable staff and technical support um, for writers like Walt Whitman, William Blake, Emily Dickinson. These archives have digitized um, published texts, but also they have uh, different versions and editions. They might have manuscript materials and personal correspondence. They're marked uh, and tagged up with uh, text encoding, uh, TEI. They might also use advanced tools like GIS maps or topic modeling to explore their corpora. It's much harder to find work of this kind with South Asian writers. Uh, many writers who are clearly important, like Henry DeRosio or Krupabai Satyanathan, um, an early Indian woman novelist and one of India's first women doctors, have un until now not really had <clears throat> any digital archives dedicated to their work, and indeed sometimes not much digital footprint at all, which right? is to say you can look in Wikipedia and you'll find these very skeletal kind of um, thumbnails about these people, but there's not really very much uh, that's easily accessible. Um, this problem is so well documented um, in the digital humanities field that Rupika Rissam, um, who I understand will be speaking, I think, tomorrow with you, um, once described the field as essentially digital canonical humanities. Um, sites like the William Blake Archive, the Rossetti Archive, the Whitman Archive have been, key to, have been key to the development of digital archives as a field and projects like Nines, um, which aggregate 19th century digital collections are overwhelmingly dominated by Anglo-American authors and texts. 
Um, so this is kind of where I come in. Uh, my interest in my, a lot of my work has been in rectifying that digital archive gap. Um, while European and American digital humanities has been slow to respond to this problem, in recent years we have seen some progress with projects like Livingston Online, uh, which takes a self-reflexive approach to the European encounter with Africa. Uh, there's a, a really new project called the One More Voice Project, um, which actually I think might even have a connection to Michigan State, I think through Adrian Wisnicki. Um, or actually, at least I met the uh, person who does that uh, project at Michigan State when I was there some time ago. Uh, there's a great project called the Early, Early Caribbean Digital Archive from Northeastern University uh, in India. There's the Tagore Variorum. Uh, there's a new project also that's emerging called the South Asia Open Archives. Um, so these are all great uh, contributions, <clears throat> but my sense is that there's uh, much more room uh, for work to be done, especially with uh, uh, Indian writers, South Asian writers other than Tagore. Um, and I would encourage people entering into the field to seriously consider doing projects dealing with South Asian writers, especially early writers and writers who worked in South Asian languages. Um, so my own interest in rectifying what I've been calling the archive gap led me to initiate a project that is much more immediately the precursor for the digital edition of Henry DeRosio's poems that I'll be talking about today. And this is a corpus that I've been building or kind of developing, uh, which I've been calling the Literature of Colonial South Asia Text Corpus. Um, and this is a, it contains a mix of uh, British as well as South Asian writers. Uh, and actually some Americans and Canadians are in there as well. Um, who, uh, whose works are known to be out of copyright in the US. And I've been collecting them into a kind of simple collection of plain text files. And the bottom of this slide, you should be able to see a link to that uh, on a GitHub site. Um, one goal of the project is to enable and encourage people who use quantitative methods to consider applying them with South Asian Anglophone materials. Um, and for this, for this, you need clean um, plain text files as a starting point. And while one can find corpora of various sorts online to use as a basis for text analysis, um, most of those aim for massive scale rather than, thematic, rather than thematic specificity. Um, I've also been in, equally invested in increasing the, the general accessibility of these texts, especially for teachers and students. So some years ago, I had started a um, project, uh, a collection centered around the Kipling family, uh, and especially Rudyard Kipling, his sister Alice Fleming, his father John Lockwood Kipling. And as I developed that project, I quickly realized that in some ways the Kipling family uh, was less interesting to me than their various Indian interlocutors. So alongside <clears throat> expected figures like Toru Dutt, Michael Madhusudan Dutt, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Dan Gopal Mukherjee, and Cornelia Sorabji, I've been interested in creating accessible digital editions of somewhat lesser known figures, <coughs> excuse me, like S.B. Banerjee and Krupabai Satyanadan that I mentioned before. On the British side, the corpus does include obvious mainstays like the Kiplings, Maud Diver, Flora Annie Steele, Sarah Jeanette Duncan, but also some lesser known figures like the American writer G.A. Henty and the Irish romance novelist B.M. Croker. And of course, I'm interested in the dialogue between uh, the um, British writers, British Canadian American writers, and the South Asian writers whose names I've mentioned. What influence did British writers have on emerging, emerging South Asian literature in English? Um, conversely, what influence, if any, did South Asian writers have on British colonial writing um, of the period? People who read Kipling or Flora Annie Steele know well that their prose is rich with Hindustani terms, sometimes a little imprecisely, sometimes a little inaccurately. <laughs> um, how dense exactly is their engagement with South Asian languages? Um, so, you know, Kipling fans, Kipling scholars are very fond of, of indicating how well he knew Hindustani. I have my doubts and reading it, reading um, Kipling uh, and with an eye towards his use of South Asian languages and potentially using digital tools to do that could be an outcome that could come out of this project of, of, of the corpus that I've been describing. When and how do we see engagement with South Asian languages in their works? What um, does the geographic representation look like? By and large, as I've been working with these materials um, for the text corpus, my goal has not been to produce full digital editions. With some of the more obscure writers mentioned above, it's not likely that many people will need fully functional versions of their texts that could be assigned, say, in a classroom. At least with some of these figures, distant reading might be more important than close reading. Um, and so now I'll get to DeRosio, and uh, I think uh, he's a figure where I think I've been really impressed and, and, and um, uh, 
and excited as I've learned more about him and as I've read more of his writing. And I think he is somebody who um, could potentially be much better known than he is. And so uh, doing a digital project on his work um, it, for me was a no brainer. It was, it was something that I, I jumped on once the opportunity presented itself. Um, so DeRosio has special importance because he appears to be the first Indian poet to write in English. Um, because of his family um, background and because of his education, he appears not to have been self-translating from an Indian language, but rather writing first and foremost in English. Um, though DeRosio died when he was quite young, and um, some of his poems have a juvenile quality, um, many of his best poems are formally sophisticated and likely to be accessible to students today. Um, finally, because of the work of scholars like Rosinka Chowdhury, Mary Ellis Gibson, and Manu Samrathi Chander, his works have, in the past 10 years, begun to gain more visibility for scholars and teachers of romantic poetry. In effect, while specialist scholars of global romanticism might know de Rosio, and many Indians will know his name as he has taught, as I understand it, in some English medium colleges and universities in India, he could potentially be better known than he is, especially here in the US or in the UK. Um, I was curious to just see whether DeRosio is being taught and, and how often there is a project um, that's based in the, in the U.S. called the Open Syllabus Project, which uses web crawlers to find college syllabi uh, that are published on the web. And when I searched that, I only found three hits for DeRosio, um, three hits for his name. By contrast, I found 4,150 hits for Percy Shelley and 2,180 hits for Byron. So there's a kind of a massive gap, a differential between the visibility and exposure of Shelley and Byron and other romantic um, kind of uh, the big six uh, and somebody like DeRosio, who in the US again is virtually unknown. As a person of mixed Portuguese, British and Indian heritage who wrote not long, not long after the advent of English medium education in India, DeRosio's position seems structurally connected to that of the Anglo Indian community. And Mary Ellis Gibson subs him up quite nicely when she writes, it is ironic, but absolutely right, that a poet of complex, um, sorry, complex political views and complex ethnic, religious and familial identifications should be thought of as the paterfamilias of Indian English poetry. De Rosio wrote exclusively in English at a time when few other Indians did so. When he wrote about the conflict between Greeks and Turks, he sympathized with the Greeks over the Turks, in part because of his religious background as a Christian. But de Rosio taught at Hindu College in Calcutta, later Presidency College, a school exclusively for Indian students, and his actual poetry is enthusiastically and patriotically Indian. For those various reasons, I decided to put together a simple digital edition of de Rosio's poetry this past summer, containing the poems from his two uh, published collections. One of those two, two books, Fakir of Jangira, could already be found as a page image scan on Hathi Trust. DeRosio's first book, um, I had to use a British library reprint um, and digitizing that required a bit more work. Um, I used a, a platform that is called Scalar, um, which I'm not sure how uh, widespread or how, vis or how available or how, how, I'm not sure how widely used it has been in India thus far, but I'm curious to find out more from you all today, hopefully. Um, here's some of the reasons why I, I like Scalar. Uh, first of all, it's a free platform developed by university affiliated digital librarians and digital humanists. Um, it's not a, a kind of not part of a big corporate entity. It's not a for profit uh, company. It also has a helpful paths structure that is well suited to the presentation of materials in sequence. Um, it has a built in visualization engine that can be helpful for giving users a visual point of entry into your collections. It's also fairly easy to use. Um, and finally, it helps that uh, I've been able to um, uh, get an instance of Scalar installed in my own university servers uh, that will be uh, permanently accessible, um, even if the platform stops uh, being developed or, or updated in the future. Um, for me, the central principle here is flexibility. People come to digital collections for different reasons and with different amounts of expertise. It's a mistake to construct sites that are too narrowly framed, uh, i.e. that are only focused on highly experienced users. Some users will want will know what they're looking for on your site. Others will just be browsing around. They're looking for something engaging, maybe something that might be accessible to students. With that multiplicity in mind, I just tried to construct a site with multiple ways in. Um, so some of the features of the of the DeRosio collection that I've put together. Um, first of all, there's a preface by Manu Samrathi Chander, who is uh, a, now kind of a pretty established scholar um, um, of DeRosio. 
Um, and so I was happy to ha be able to kind of convince him to write a short preface uh, to the project itself. Um, the probably the most useful thing I've tried to do, or I hope would be useful at least, is um, to uh, mark uh, uh, thematic tags throughout De Rosio's poetry. Um, so uh, De Rosio was 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 deeply engaged with British and Irish romantic poets. Um, and sometimes he explicitly marks that by giving an epigraph to the poem that at hand uh, that comes from the poet that he's borrowing from, uh, making the, ta the task of detecting the borrowing much easier. Um, so I also tagged poems uh, that as, as uh, intertexts, um, as intertextual uh, for ease of access uh, in my project. I've also been interested in DeRosio's descriptions of Indian locales in his poetry. Though he was born and raised in Kolkata, he spent some time as a teenager working in Bhagalpur in Bihar, and as a result had at least some exposure to rural India and to the broader Indian landscape. Many of those geographical reference points show up in poems like The Fakir of Jangir, uh, but he also has a poem called The Ruins of Rajmahal, which describes uh, Shah Shuja's palace in what is today Jharkhand. Um, I've collected all of these tagged poems in a page on the site called South Asian Locales. Um, and finally, I wanted to mention just, uh, again, with the idea of access and the idea of kind of a broad range of, of users and readers, uh, I created a resource for teachers, which is a collection of a few poems that I think would be especially likely to be effective in the classroom for a short unit on De Rosio. This includes some um, obvious choices like De Rosio's Harp of India and some poems um, that seem important because of their thematization of British Romanticism, as well as with uh, his engagement with South Asian locales, with uh, Indian religions, with Islam, with Hinduism. Um, so uh, let me move to the next. I just wanted to give you a quick idea of what one of the kind of visualizations that's on my site, um, which is uh, these are the, the pink, the, the pink circles you see there are thematic tags that I created, nationalism, uh, ancient Greece, colonization or colonialism, Christianity, uh, inter in the intertext with English Romanticism and so on. The orange dots are the poems themselves. Um, so you can see that in some cases, uh, some of the poems have more than one um, tag and they can be uh, linked to or kind of talking about uh, multiple uh, topics at once. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Manu Sumrithi Chander's book has been a, a big uh, one in terms of improving or kind of increasing the visibility of De Rosio's work. Uh, the book that Manu wrote is called Brown Romantics, Poetry and Nationalism in the Global 19th Century. In it, Chander argues that people like De Rosio, as well as the Guianese, Guianese writer Egbert Martin and the Australian writer Henry Lawson, were engaged in close dialogue with what's now canonical British Romanticism. Their output could be described as imitative, but still reflective of a marginalized positionality. And the fact that these figures were largely overlooked as the romantic canon came to be organized suggests uh, a hidden racialized agenda in the process of canon formation. So here's a quote from um, Manu Chander's book. Uh, to put it another way, brown romantics are not marginalized because they are brown. On the contrary, they are brown because they are marginalized. Their capacity to participate as poets in the cultural field is restricted by their relationship to the colonizer prior to their participation in it, which in turn exposes the racial dimension of the World Republic of Letters. What Chander is alluding to here seems like an important point when reading De Rosio. While he does identify strongly and exclusively as an Indian poet with a strong national identity, he does not identify necessarily as racially other to the poets he's in dialogue with. To some extent, this reflects the unique moment in time of the early 19th century, when De Rosio was educated at schools that included British, mixed race Eurasian, and Indian young men. And it's worth noting that women were not admitted to these schools at that time. Chander builds on a reading of De Rosio by Makaran Paranjape, <clears throat> who wrote, it is quote, this is a quote from Paranjape, it is not possible to explain or understand a poet like De Rosio merely by uh, speaking of influence or imitation. In fact, whatever, whatever he borrowed, he superimposed in his local Indian material, creating a new, a new idiom in English poetry. For Chander, this suggests we can understand De Rosio's complex positioning as a, quote, transcultural assemblage, by, we, by means of which the poet retains his position of authority in a field that places supreme value on the originality and um, situates himself in relation to fellow bards. Um, and so Chander goes on to explore in some depth uh, Rosio's dialogue with 
Lord Byron in De Rosio's poem, Heaven. Um, and I thought it might be interesting, it might be helpful for those of you who may not know De Rosio very well, to take a few minutes and do just a little bit of close reading. So this is a, a digital project. Um, I'm interested in distant reading. Um, but I'm also trained as a close reader, and I find these poems very exciting and interesting to read in their own granularity and in the, with their own language. So the uh, the actual dialogue between Byron and Derosio is a really interesting one, and I hope you'll forgive me for actually looking at some actual poetry for a few minutes. But here here's Byron. <clears throat> know you the land where the cypress and myrtle are emblems of deeds that are done in their clime where the rage of the vulture, the love of the turtle, now melt into sorrow, now madden to crime. And the voice of the nightingale never is mute. Tis the clime of the east, tis the land of the sun. Can he smile on such deeds as his children have done? Oh, wild as the accents of lovers farewell are the hearts which they bear and the tales which they tell. So that's just a short excerpt. I, you see the ellipses there. I just wanted to make it as brief as possible. As I read this, I ask myself, what is the Orient in Byron's poem? Um, it appears to be a place of exotic foliage. You see uh, the references there to Cyprus and Myrtle, as well as various forms of sin and crime, deeds which are done in the clime, where clime rhymes with crime two lines later. The word deeds is repeated twice in the short excerpt above, as is the word clime. And there is a strong and repeated emphasis on the revelation of secret truths of those sinful deeds. Um, to my eye, this is classic Orientalism, in effect, where the properties of the East are seen as at once immutable and beyond human agency, and is inherently sinful and unspeakable. It's Orientalism as a form of projection, the East as the West's unseemly underbelly, rather than as a cultural context in its own right. And while de Rosio would not have had access to Edward Said's critique when he read this in the 1820s as a teenager, his own homage to Byron in the poem that he wrote called Heaven aims to tell a decidedly different story. So some of it you'll see actually borrows some of the tropes, some of the language, uh, the rhetorical gestures. And I put the, you know, the opening line in red there to kind of give you a clear sense of what that looks like. Um, and here's uh, De Rosio. Know ye the land where the fountain is springing, whose waters give life and whose flow never ends where cherub and seraph in concert are singing, the hymn that in odor and incense ascends, where sighs are ne'er heard and where tears are ne'er shed from hearts that might elsewhere have broken and bled, where truth is no name and where bliss is no dream, tis the seed of our God, tis the land of the blessed, the kingdom of glory, the region of rest, the boon that to man shall hereafter be given, tis love's hallowed empire, tis heaven, tis heaven. It's striking that de Rosio does not mark the East here as other. Indeed, he's not naming the East at all um, in heaven. From a space of sin, de Rosio has decided to use the exotic framing um, that he borrowed from Byron to instead describe a holy place, the seat of our God, as he puts it. As I read the poem, the place he's describing actually is literally intended to be heaven, um, not a terrestrial location, though in large part because of the homage to Byron's very well-known poem, there's an unmistakable recasting here of the idea of exoticism, um, uh, the exotic locale from a space of sin and degraded otherness to a kind of sublime and sacred otherness. One surprise for me in reading de Rosio's poems as a non-specialist was the discovery that the Romantic canon looked a little different to him than it does to us today. There are several poems inspired by Byron and Shelley, of course, but there are also as many inspired by Thomas Campbell, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, the Irish poet Thomas More, Several of de Rosio's poems borrowing um, from Byron ex uh, specifically focused on the idea of a valiant and noble people of ancient pedigree resisting foreign domination. Um, and so the, often that's the Greeks, right? He was interested, he, Byron was very involved in the, the Greek War of Independence. Um, there's, interestingly, there's a somewhat of a potential there when, when de Rosio gets involved uh, in a subversive reading, um, the posture of nationalist resistance uh, that you see in de Rosio um, could be interpreted by Indian readers as a challenge to British colonialism. And we'll do one more poem uh, or one more kind of dialogue, I guess you could say. And this would be between Moore, uh, Thomas Moore and, and de Rosio. And then I'll move to a conclusion after that. Um, and so I'll read this as well. This is Thomas Moore. Dear harp of my country, in darkness I found thee. The cold chain of silence had hung o'er thee long when proudly my own island harp I unbound thee and gave all thy chords to light, freedom, and song. 
Dear harp of my country, farewell to thy numbers. This sweet wreath of song is the last we shall twine. Go sleep with the sunshine of fame on thy slumbers, till touched by some hand less unworthy than mine. If the pulse of the patriot, soldier, or lover have throbbed at our late, tis thy glory alone. I was but as the wind passing heedlessly over, and all the wild sweetness I waked was thy own. Here Moore takes on the posture of the national bard, the person who has, by chance, been given the opportunity to play the harp of my country. The poet disavows any special capacity. Um, uh, he describes some hand less unworthy than mine that needs to emerge to truly play the harp as it should be played. But clearly the disavowal is a kind of theatrical gesture rather than a serious part of the argument. From this point on, after I play it, the poet suggests, the wild sweetness of the island will be given life through sweet wrath of song. And let's compare that to DeRozio's um, take on the same gesture. Um, and this is a poem he wrote called Harp of India. And again, I used colors here to, um, to kind of show the matching, to show the, 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 the degree of borrowing. Um, all, the, the, all, the, uh, all the words that are, that are colored something other than black here are words that are coming straight from the moor, right? So he's using breeze, silence, chords. These are all from the moor poem that I just read. Why hangst thou lonely on yon withered bough? Unstrung forever must thou there remain. Thy music once was sweet, who hears it now? Why doth the breeze sigh o'er thee in vain? Silence hath bound thee with her fatal chain. Neglected, mute, and desolate art thou, like ruined monument on desert plain. Oh, many a hand more, more worthy far than mine, once thy harmonious chords to sweetness gave, and many a wreath for them did fame entwine, a flower still blooming on the minstrel's grave. Those hands are cold, but if thy notes divine may be by mortal wakened once again, harp of my country, let me strike the strain. Mary Ellis Gibson, the critic Mary Ellis Gibson, has a persuasive take on this poem. Um, she describes DeRozio's gesture here as a, po a poetics of what she calls a poetics of cancellation, noting the somewhat confusing hint of a silenced Indian music um, in the poem. If and when that music were to be awakened, what exactly would it sound like? Um, would it sound like Western music? Would it sound like uh, you know, traditional Indian uh, Hindustani classical music? Gibson notes that the harp of India reflects the complexity of the poet's situation as a person of multiple identities and identifications from the impossibility of writing a national poetry for a nation that can only be imagined in some futurity and from the extreme tensions already visible in the biblical progenitor of the bardic trope. Um, Manuchander echoes that when he uh, writes the following. Um, and I think he's, again, he's responding to the harp of India in particular, this particular poem that we just read. What qualifies de Rosio to stand as a representative of India? Is it the fact that unlike earlier Anglophone poets living in India, he was born there? Or is it the trace of native ancestry and the Eurasian poet uh, of primarily English and Portuguese descent? Um, indeed, is it even possible to speak of a national poet of India in the 1820s before the rise of coherent nationalist movements in the region? In my own assessment of the similarity between the two poems, I see slight rhetorical differences that perhaps help to alleviate um, the concern that Tarosio's claim, um, attempt to claim a kind of bardic nationalism might be premature, where Moore's disavowal of his status as bard presumptive is framed um, in the past tense. He writes, I was but as the wind. Um, DeRozio's is anticipatory, proleptic. The national song in his version is yet to be sung. Sadly, DeRozio passed away before he could flesh out the vision he was attempting to call into being with these ambitious early poems. And I think at this point, I'll try and stop sharing if I can get the mouse to behave. Um, okay, it looks like I did it. Um, and I just have a quick conclusion. I think I have time for a conclusion. Um, uh, and the conclusion is just called brainstorming um, because this is sort of um, uh, kind of open-ended and I have a lot of questions and ideas about future work that could be done. Um, as I've indicated a few times, I think that the South Asian digital humanities community has made some very impressive strides in the past five years alone. Um, but there's much more that could be done. With respect to DeRozio in particular, I have three kind of ideas or thoughts about uh, work that could be done further, either uh, the work that I might do or work that might be done in collaboration with other scholars. Um, so first, in the poems quoted here, I've marked particularly important keywords where DeRozio borrows language directly from British and Irish poets. Um, and I tried to flag those with the colors um, and the, the, the quotes that I showed you. 
would it be possible to use natural language processing um, to come up with a quantitative way of measuring the influence of one poet on another, a similarity index or perhaps an influence index, not so un unlike what uh, we use when we, when we use um, plagiarism detection tools. Um, the, the goal, of course, is not to diminish a poet like Derosio, who borrows um, from other poets, but rather to indic indicate the broad prevalence of this practice in literary history. A second idea, just as Derosio was influenced by British and Irish poets, he also left quite a legacy in Calcutta in the years following his death with the rise of a, a movement called the Young Bengal Movement, which featured a formidable group of intellectuals and writers, most of whom published on social and historical topics. Uh, so Piri Chand Mitter, uh, Mitter did publish at least one novel. Um, is there a hidden line of influence between Derosio and subsequent Indian English poetry? And third, how and where is Derosio being taught today? Um, earlier, I mentioned my sense that at least in the UK and the US, Derosio is not widely taught. I gather that he's more uh, prevalent in India, better known. I know that he continues to be celebrated at Presidency University, um, but how widely is he taught? Can we quantify that, uh, perhaps by doing a version of the Open Syllabus Project that would focus on South Asian writers and focus on South Asian universities? Um, to what extent have English departments at Indian universities begun to decenter the English canon? Beyond DeRosio, um, I would want to return to the idea of the archive gap that I mentioned at the start and suggest that the urgency of the project of attempting to rectify it, um, in addition to simply building out um, usable digital collections that are accessible to a broad range of readers, there's considerable work to be done with respect to quantitative text analysis. A collection like the um, literature of colonial South Asia corpus that I mentioned earlier could be a start in moving in that direction. This is going to be a large effort, and I would be eager to hear from others who have already been working in these areas, um, and I'm more than happy to collaborate. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Singh. That was really, really a very engaging and very interesting talk. And you have opened us so many ways for us to think about uh, digital humanities, and especially digital edition projects. Uh, through your own praxis, you uh, have uh, you know, highlighted uh, some of the uh, problematics, the theoretical problematics of digital humanities, like the gap between, uh, you know, digital gap between global north and global south, and uh, uh, the the kind of, uh, uh, you know, accessibility Indians have to literature and Indian literature, uh, you know, uh, uh, is open to others to access. So, so both ways, I think we uh, Indian uh, writers as well as Indian readers mm. are at a disadvantage. So uh, perhaps it's time uh, for digital humanities to uh, work towards bridging uh, this, this gap in digital archives. And what you uh, underlined through your talk, uh, you know, the importance of quantitative method, natural language processing and how that can uh, you know, uh, bring to light uh, the influence, uh, uh, you know, which not only uh, uh, colonial or English poets had on Asian poets, uh, Asian writers, but also Asian writers had on uh, the colonial writers. So, so both these things, you know, uh, uh, these, these are some very important, uh, you know, questions for us to think and ponder and carry forward uh, in our work. So thank you very much. We look forward to more interactions with you. I'll pass it on to rapporteurs to take up the questions. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, sir, for this very, very enlightening talk. Uh, I have the first question for you, uh, which is that can you please speak of the difference in the levels of difficulty that one is likely to confront while digitizing Anglophone and non-Anglophone texts since you work with both? Um, well, yeah, I I, um, I have worked a little with um, with uh, Indian language texts with some, some materials in Hindi and some materials in Punjabi. Um, but I'm limited, and uh, um, you know, as somebody raised in the U.S., my uh, reading ability is limited, um, in especially in Hindi. Um, uh, and um, and uh, so some of that, the I mean, I can't, I can't, I should say, I can't speak too extensively because my work has been relatively limited, um, and it's mostly been with respect to the the Kipling's project, where I got interested in, um, especially in Lahore, because he lived in Lahore. The Kiplings lived in Lahore for so long. Uh, and there were active Punjabi language newspapers that were being published around uh, around um, the Kiplings. So I began to get interested in what were these Punjabi newspapers? How much of them? How many of them were preserved? What what can we access? 
And what I found was that they are there. There are some. Um, there are some that are in um, libraries. Some of them um, I found in India. Some of them uh, there's a there's a there's a project called the Punjab Digital Archive that has a fair amount of those materials. But they are very spotty. That they are there. There are there are bits and pieces of things. Um, a lot of them were the newspapers that were done in at least in in, in Punjabi were were not uh, typeset. They were they were facsim They were handwritten scripts in Gurmukhi, and that that were then uh, printed. That were then kind of uh, like reproduced. Um, so they're actually kind. Of, they can be hard to read. Um, they're not. They they they're, they're, they're especially uh, one, these ones that are more than a hundred years old or one hundred and fifty years old in some cases. Um, so there's a number of difficulties. So one of the the first one is the, is accessing the materials. The second would be um, uh, the the condition of the materials. Uh, the third would be I think then from there I think um, you know to to really put these materials in dialogue you need to not just digitize them and create Punjabi language versions or Hindi versions of those newspapers, but actually. Um, you want to translate them, right? You want them to be uh, accessible into multiple different, uh, multiple readers. Um, so there's multiple challenges that come up with those. Um, certainly, OCR is uh, is extremely limited in terms of its usability, usefulness in the situation I'm describing. Uh, looking at those those Punjabi newspapers from Lahore, um, if there are others in the room who have done some of that work, I would be very curious to hear more about uh, your experiences with that. I know that's a, a topic in this conference as well. So I'm hopefully, if the paper is not at, at you know four o'clock in the morning in my time, I'll try and tune in to hear about uh, some of what's being done um, uh, uh, with from other other researchers that are at this event. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question for you is that the web page of the Kiplings in India describes this project as a, and I quote, digital thematic collection, unquote. So can you please uh, explain and talk to us about what it means and how does it differ from a digital critical edition or a digital scholarly edition? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's actually a brilliant question, and it's one that is very actively discussed by, um, within the digital humanities community. That as I've been encountering it and um, kind of entering into it in the past decade, um, and the, there's there's several different terms here. One is a critical edition. One is scholarly edition. Another term that that this questioner, I think this is Rohan Chohan, uh, asks uh, is um, uh, I'm seeing it in the chat also. Uh, uh, the other term that he doesn't use is um, it, it's not being used there is um, the term archive, right? So there's another, there's, there's, I guess there's really four different possible kind of terms that one could use. I like the term digital thematic collection because it uh, it doesn't have um, certain kinds of connotations of uh, kind of uh, formal requirements that terms like digital archive or digital scholarly edition might have. Um, there are a certain set of expectations that scholars will have if you are producing. Um, uh, specifically, I think a digital a digital critical edition. Um, so, like when I was working again with the Kiplings, but I think it's also true of DeRosio. I think um, uh, there's an expectation that if you're if you're producing an edition of works by a particular author, that you limit yourself to that author's works, that you present it as neutrally and as objectively as you can. You don't put in your own political biases or ideological investments. You don't have idiosyncratic projects like the kind of the visualization that I showed you, where of uh, the thematic tags. Uh, those are also subject. Those thematic tags I mentioned also are my tags, right? Those are my subjective interpretations. If I read a poem and I think this is a poem about Christianity, I'm tagging it as such. Um, not every critic or every editor would agree with those assessments, and so I think uh, I, I find that those terms like digital scholarly edition are too restrictive for the the kind of work that I want to do. Um, I want to. I, I, I'm interested in producing editions that are going to. Um, be making a point, right? That have an argument, and in many cases that have a post-colonial uh, argument or a post-colonial an argument grounded in post-colonial theory. I also have an interest in in making um, in making materials, uh, producing materials that are going to be very accessible. So I'm not necessarily just making um, collections that are just for for serious scholars. So that's so collection for me has a kind of openness and inclusiveness to different approaches, different methods, and. The, the the voice of the editor um, is kind of much more welcome, I think, um, in the in the in the, when you're using the rhetoric of a collection rather than an edition or an archive. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, here goes another one. Uh, could you also please mm -hmm. comment on uh, some of the methodologies of decolonizing the digital humanities? Yeah, this is a this is a big. Uh, question. I actually, um, 
taught a class just this fall that I called Decolonizing Digital Humanities with, to try and suss out what exactly this might mean and how we might do this. And um, it's, it's challenging. And I, I know, I know uh, Professor Rupika Rissam will be speaking with you uh, tomorrow as well. So she has, I'm sure, a lot to say about this. Is she? It's really, she's the one who um, uh, created the field <laughs> in some ways of post-colonial digital humanities and, and, and really kind of pushed forward a lot of the arguments about uh, kind of trying to do this, decolonizing the digital humanities. Um, and I think um, the methodologies are, I mean, some of the things that you see, that I talked about today, the archive gap, um, that is that for me is that that's one of the places where I feel that there's a, pl a significant room to make an intervention. Um, there are scholars that have been doing really valuable and important work in digital humanities um, for you know years now for generations, um, but they really have been very focused on a very narrow set of authors, and they haven't been very interested in in rethinking the canon and displacing um, Europe, displacing America from their orientation. And so somebody like me or somebody like Professor Rissom, I think that, that our, we see our, our job as in part to intervene in that conversation. And, and certainly as somebody who's based in an American university, um, that's what I kind of bring to the table with my own colleagues. Um, and so part of that is just simply a shift in, in, um, in, in focus and a shift in, in what we pay our attention to, what we think is important. But there may be other things as well. I mean, there may be a, a case to be made for within the canon, within um, bodies of work that are, that are uh, um, that are you know like the the Dickenses and the George Eliots and the the Virginia Woolfs of the world um, that that when people produce digital archives of those of those of those authors' works that maybe it's also valuable to have um, engagement with the representation of the colonies to think about the representation of India Africa the Caribbean the the slave trade and to insist that that be part of the conversation so there there part of this is about what we talk about but it may also be about how we talk about the topics that we've already been doing. Um, and so for, as I talked about this with my own students this fall, I try to do a little bit of both um, to try and get them to look at topics and authors they may never have heard of, uh, topic and issues that they may never have um, uh, thought to investigate before. Um, there's a group of American grad students that now know a whole lot about uh, Pandita, Pandita Ramabai, <laughs> um, the, the great, uh, the great um, activist and organizer and educator um, uh, and it, because I just felt that she was an important part of this conversation. And one of the things we discovered is that there needs to be way more about her on the on the Internet than there is. There needs to her archives. I understand there's some project that that has been in development for Pandita Ramabai's archives in Pune, but I don't think it's up yet. I don't think it's available. And uh, for my students, they were they were frustrated at how little they could find once I kind of gave her them a sense of what of who she was and what she did. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. I think I might have gotten a little off track there once I started mentioning but the Ramabai. But anyway, okay. Uh, another question, if there are more. Yes, sir. Uh, so we have a question that says, uh, you have worked on finding out borrowings of De Rosio from the British poets by using, uh, I presume, some sort of coll collation software. Have you thought of any collation software for index scripts? Uh, I'm not, if the, if that's there, I'm not familiar with it. And I would think it would be a, 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 a really impressive idea. Um, so if, yeah, I don't, I don't know of any, of any such software that's there, but it would be valuable to have that. Um, so no, I, I guess my answer is very brief there because I don't actually know very much about it. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, you also mentioned uh, using a scalar platform. Uh, would you please mind elaborating upon it? Because we have been getting to know about so many different, uh, you know, platforms and, uh, you know, applications that we can use. So do you mind elaborating a bit on it? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm, um, I've been a big uh, supporter of scalar, and I've used it in several of my digital um, collections projects. And it's a it's a very um, effective um, platform specifically for uh, collections that have uh, some scholarly um, kind of in, uh, engagement and that are that are oriented towards producing uh, at least a semblance of of a kind of replicating a digital text. Right. It's it, that the, there's a there's a there's a, a part of the architecture in Scalar called paths. They call that that's that's what they, that's what they, the term they use in the, within the platform. And the path is essentially like chapters in a in a in, in a that that helps you simulate a kind of linear uh, access to a text. The nice thing about the scalar paths, though, is that they're flexible. So that if you uh, create, um, let's say, I for for Derosio, I, I have to, there's 
two books of poems that are in the collection. And each of them is structured through a path structure so that you go from, to replicate the table of contents in the original editions. Um, but I'm also interested in all these intertexts to English Romanticism. So the poems that, are, that I find to be, um, to be marked as such, or that I've, that I've marked as such, I have a path that's dedicated to them as well. So a reader that just wants to learn about, just wants to learn about how De Rosio engaged with that, or how De Rosio represented Indian locations um, uh, in some of the, the poems that I mentioned, they can also find paths that, that, that take them through the poems in that particular uh, way. So they, they don't have to read all 100 poems to get at the 15 poems that deal with the particular topic that they want to explore or learn more about. Um, so I find that flexibility incredibly helpful. The one thing I'm not sure about is how well um, uh, this, how, how well represented or how widely used Scalar has been in India. Um, and um, I, I'm also wondering whether, whether how, you know, how fast, like my own project, which is based on my, my university servers, I'm wondering how, whether it's slow and whether it might be valuable to have a mirror uh, that might be hosted at, you know, at a university like yours, um, that might be more, that might be, that just might work faster and better um, for, for um, users in India. Um, I did create on my site, I created a plain text version, which is downloadable, um, that if anybody gets to my site and finds it to be slow and just wants to get the poems, they can just download the, the, the plain text version and just read it on their offline on their computers. So that's in line with some of the minimal computing ideas that people, um, I, I, I heard Sean Pugh mentioning earlier, um, and I think I also heard um, uh, Nishat Saidi mentioning earlier as well. So I think that that, that, that that's one of the things that I ended up creating because I just wasn't sure about whether it would be running very slowly um, 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 from, from where you are. So sort of follow, a follow up question on this only that are there any projects that are using Scalar for South Asian scripts? You could, there's no, there's actually no, has it, there's no um, obstacle there because Scalar is, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a content management system that allows you to um, put in any text you want to use. So if you wanted to do, I haven't tried it, but if you wanted to do a scalar project um, in Hindi, there really is nothing that would stop you. I don't know of anyone that's done that, um, but I, the, I, I think that that would be, um, that there would be no obstacle to that because it would work the same way it would work in a platform like WordPress or, or other content management platforms where you just are, can input whatever material you need to put. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't think I know of a project that does that as of yet. One okay. of you should do one, <laughs> or I will work with you. If any of you are interested, I'm happy to work with any of you to, to, to put those together. I am sure you'll find a lot of enthusiasts here and which kind of also brings me to my final question that what kind of collaborations, you know, do you think are actually needed, you know, to progress in this area? Um, that's a really good question. And I think I know that from my conversations with D Professor Rissam, I think that, that one of the concerns I, I, she has and that I, I share with her is that, you know, we, since we, since digital humanities is very developed in the US and, ha and people have been doing it for a long time, um, there's a concern that uh, someone like me um, could come to, uh, to an Indian university and say, here's what I'm doing, here's what you should do, and kind of give the instructions and give the, a, a kind of directive that's, that's sort of informed by my own kind of American background. And I'm very nervous about that. I'm very, I'm very I, I wouldn't want my kind of, um, my statements or my arguments to be taken as somehow more authoritative or more, um, more useful than, than anyone else's. And so I think, I think well, I'm very interested in, in coming back. The last time I was in India was 20, eight, February of 2018. And I got to go to visit Ashoka University at that time. And I, I'm very interested in coming back again uh, soon and actually learning what's, what priorities people have um, at Indian universities and to help kind of, if I can help um, uh, people uh, kind of um, achieve the and, and achieve the projects that they want to build and not necessarily build the projects that I think they should build. Um, so that's 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 something that I think is a, a really important um, caution that, I, that that we should bring to the table as American scholars coming and in dialogue with people in, in India. Um, so the collaborations I think should start there, but I'm actually from there, there's really, it's really wide open now. There's all kinds of things that we could be doing. One of the limitations of course, is just our skill sets. I mean, I, I'm not a coder. Um, I could do a little bit of coding, a little bit, but um, 
there are things that other people can do that that I can't do. And so I think one of the real possibilities for collaboration could be to find people who can do things that uh, have particular skills that can work with people who don't have those skills, but might have others and to work together to try and, and make interesting things happen. Thank you, sir. So one more question. Uh, can you also talk about uh, natural language processing for uh, South Asian languages? And yeah, again, any kind of collaborations, uh, you know, in this area as well? I mean, I think that the NLP um, platforms that people have been using, and I'm not I'm not a big expert, but I, I would encourage you if you're uh, if you're curious about learning more about natural language processing, um, uh, there's a there the, the the main one that I've worked with is the one that's that's built out of Stanford. So if you Google Stanford NLP, uh, you can begin to get a, sort of some overviews and sort of get kind of learn some of the basics of how it works. Those they they have been making an attempt to branch out of into languages other than uh, Western languages, and I think they might actually now have a Hindi um, uh, um, uh, kind of pa uh, module uh, in Stanford NLP. Um, that some of the things that that you that that I'm familiar with that that I've used NLP for with literature, uh, such as um, things like um, uh, geographic tagging, right? So NLP can go into a big text or a set of texts, a corpus, and if you're looking for locations in those in that corpus, it can find them for you. Um, so I've done that with you know Anglophone texts with the Kiplings, for instance. Um, it can be done also, I think, in in um, in uh, with with the Hindi packet, the module that's been created on Stanford NLP. Um, so it's happening. Um, I haven't done it extensively, but it, it's definitely going on. Uh, the place to start for people who are new to it might be that particular um, that particular co phrasing phrasing or code word, and um, you can learn more from there. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, another thing that when you were working with Rosio, uh, what these instances of intertextuality, right, with the British Romantics. Were there any other, uh, you know, writers or poets of that time that you intro were you interested in or you found or you thought about incorporating in your project? Um, I mean, I think there's a, there are some. I mean, there's a there are some of them are European writers or British and Scottish and um, Irish writers. Um, uh, one big topic that comes up and that I think I, I'm, since I'm not a romanticist, I'm, I'm actually, I need to learn more about is just the extensive um, investment in Orientalism that British, Irish, Scottish uh, writers had at that time. They were fascinated by, uh, by you know, the Middle East, by the Arab world. They were fascinated, they were fascinated by an idea of India, uh, often places that like India as a place that many of them had never been to. <laughs> so there was a kind of like, there were poems about India that, you know, Byron never went, but he wrote poems about it. And how, how did that work? What was that, what was that all about? Um, so one chapter that would be really interesting to just to kind of dive more deeply into would be that, uh, the, just the generalized Orientalism, Romantic Orientalism. A second would be there are poets. I mean, there are figures. Um, some of them were people that De Rosio knew. There was a, a, a Scottish teacher named Drummond. He studied in his school. Uh, De Rosio studied in his school in Calcutta, um, and Drummond was a poet. He also wrote um, poet poetry and literature. And uh, I wanted to learn more about that and see learn more about that dialogue. There is some interesting. Um, there's an interesting woman writer uh, called Emma Roberts, who is a Scottish woman. She was in India for for many years. Um, and uh, Mary Ellis Gibson has written about her work. Um, she's also a really interesting figure of, again, a contemporary of De Rosio, although I don't think that she, she and De Rosio knew each other. Um, but um, those, are some, those are some people I'm interested in learning more about um, that are con roughly contemporaneous. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. No, sir, thank you very much. I mean, this is pertinently important because we teach romanticism and like you mentioned, we teach English canonical romanticism. So once we get to know more about, you know, these, you know, conversations, interactions that were happening with poets here and there, it would be really interesting. So thank you very much, sir, once again, for introducing us to this uh, wonderful project that you're doing and this very, very enlightening uh, talk. And now I hand over the mic to Professor Nishad Zaidi to introduce our next speaker for the session. Thank you, Ankita, and thank you, Professor Singh. That was really, really very enlightening and very uh, interesting. Uh, we now move on to our uh, second speaker. Our second speaker was supposed to be Nirmala, but Nirmala will join in five minutes. She had one official call. So we'll move on to uh, Yusuf Said Sahab.
uh, he is we can consider him as one of our own due to his association with MCRC uh, he is an independent filmmaker a scholar working on the theme of culture and arts of south asia uh, uh, of course he is very well known uh, uh, for his film khayal uh, darpan basant and campus rising which many of our students also must be familiar with uh, they they have been admired all over the world these films have been admired all over the world he is also the author of muslim devotional art in india which was published by athlech in 2012 uh, his project tasveer ghar uh, which is a digital archive of, uh, of south asian popular visual culture uh, which he talked about in the workshop uh, is also extremely extremely interesting so i uh, welcome uh, yusuf sahab uh, So over to you, Yusuf Said Sahab. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Nishad Sahab, uh, and good morning to everyone. I suppose some of you are not in morning <laughs> in different parts of the world. I was supposed to start my presentation at twelve noon, but uh, I've been asked to uh, prepone it. And uh, my presentation is actually involving a lot of uh, digital, uh, a lot of uh, uh, multimedia. uh but at the last moment i'm just realizing that i i hope that i will be able to play some of that because this presentation is about uh the title of my presentation is the cult of youtube mushairas in india's small towns now this obviously means that you need to have access to youtube and uh, the recordings that you would be able to uh, uh play and watch Uh, but before that before i uh, jump into my actual topic let me say a few things about the mushaira itself uh, since we are dealing with uh, digital humanities and uh, i am uh, new to this uh, in fact i i don't really consider myself as an uh, you know um, formally a part of the academic uh, academia because i'm more of a media practitioner uh, and i deal with media i, I look at the media and i look at how uh, especially the online media social media is uh, you know working out and i also interested in literature urdu literature i mm, a couple of years ago we did a conference uh, on the popular culture of urdu language in fact i think some of uh, the participants here i can see they were part of that uh, conference also like i can see saba and and others so um i have been really fascinated by how <clears throat> by the popularity of urdu language uh, and urdu poetry on social media um, and especially the way uh, these mushairas have become a big uh, big uh, kind of a cult uh, on on youtube so before we go into that i mean uh, why i say cult because some of the videos uh, of the mushairas are being watched as many as 40 lakh times over one year uh, so imagine 40 lakh times somebody's video and this is not the entire mushaira recording like these are recordings of a specific uh, shayar uh, or shayara poet or poetess uh, who are being watched uh, so many times and not only watched but also being commented upon and and there is a there is a dialogue going on on the internet uh, which one can see i mean i would say that uh, if even if i am not able to play some of the videos today uh, you can easily go to the youtube or any other social media platform and search for mushaira or indian mushairas and you will be able to get such brilliant examples of uh, you know what's going on in these places so uh, why is it why is a mushaira such a craze uh, on these uh, uh, places before we go into that just a few uh, lines about what exactly is mushaira some of you are familiar with it it's a it's a it's a soiree or a, or a gathering uh, of poets um uh, where poets gather and they and they recite poetry but uh, the most important thing uh, and this is something that i personally believe the most important definition of mushaira is is that it is a two way process it's not a one way process it's not just that uh, uh, somebody reads out poetry and um, you know uh, and that's it no it it is uh, there is a, there is a very important concept in mushaira which is called daad dena 
दाद देना मीन्स दैट टू टू प्रेज और टू और टू और टू अप्रीशिएट द मुशायरा द अप्रीशिएट द पोइट्री विच इज बींग रेड आउट एंड दाद देना द ऑडियंस विच इज प्रेजेंट देयर दे आर सपोज टू बी प्रेजिंग यू दे आर सपोज टू बी you know a pro you know there is there is a whole uh, mass appeal uh, which which is part of the mushaira so this two way process which happens that the poets read out their poetry and the audience responds to it uh, it is very important to uh, study both the you know both the, these both kind of processes not just one and then when we move on to the digital media or the digital humanities uh a third dimension is added to it like earlier it was two dimensions the the stage and the audience and then now there's a third dimension that is added which is the recording of these uh videos the recording of these mushairas being uploaded on the internet and that becomes a craze that becomes a cult by itself and how people are watching it and how people are appreciating and responding and not only that but um people in the small towns are actually looking at these videos they are sharing amongst each other on their mobile phones there there is a huge sharing going on on social media and then based on those sharings the ratings or the public or the or the kind of a uh, you know the uh, fame of those poets increases and then when you have a small town mushaira when somebody is organizing it they actually look at the videos on youtube and decide okay this this particular poet is doing well or poet as is doing well or not doing well and the local people you know there is an entire uh, machinery there's an entire committee which is formed in every local you know small town these are called the mushaira committees and the mushaira committees are deciding who uh, should we invite and there's a lot of money uh, involved again i would say money at both levels money at the level of the organizing uh, of the physical mushaira and the money which is being earned on youtube uh, through uh, you know advertisements and so on so the money which is there at the level of the uh, you know local mushaira there is a committee which is formed there are local sponsors which are coming in they are supporting it uh, there's a whole pandal which is being created the hospitality of the poets and the and you know you can't just invite any um, any local poet if you want a a mushaira to be successful you have to invite somebody you know well known so there is a whole i would say a galaxy of poets uh, you know the organized the, the the mushaira organizers have a list uh, that these are the top and 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 you know there are actually grades given to these poets that these are the top people and then the the people who are in the middle and then the people who are somewhere at the bottom so you have to you have to invite a range of these people but the top people have to be there now among these uh, middle or the lower end um i have been my my interest was basically to look at how the women poets are uh, not only invited a, a lot but they are also kind of celebrated and they are also appreciated in a different way which may uh, you know which may not exactly be a, appreciated by the so called uh, the you know the 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 real um, elitist kind of scholars of urdu they may find that too uh, too too cheap in a way uh, because they they believe that these local mushairas are actually not uh, maintaining what they call the mayar or the standard of poetry and they feel that uh, these local mushairas are really uh in a way damaging uh, urdu poetry rather than uh, doing anything uh, better now i have been studying this not from a literary point of view not from a, crit a literary criticism point of view but rather from point of view of the popular culture because i study popular culture i study how uh, culture uh, permeates the local people the masses rather than the classes or the elite people so for me um, it doesn't matter i mean you know this mayar or standard is not not such a big thing you know um, i mean if if uh, if somebody is appreciating poetry uh, even if they are farmers or or laborers or 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 you know rickshaw puller or whoever it is uh, it is their right and and that is how urdu survives in in these uh, places so um what i found uh, found out let me just uh, 
so so this committee the local committees which are formed in in the these small towns there are different uh, um, you know uh, sort of positions given to people there is a sadr or president there is a muntazim and uh, there are uh, there is a nizamat uh, because the person who conducts the the the, the mushaira is called nazim or, so he does the nizamat uh, or the sort of a convener or the or, or the anchor of the mushaira and usually they uh, invite the poets and and they uh, i mean invite as in invite to the uh, to the to the event to the place and organize all their host, hospitality etc and they are the ones who uh, also invite them on the stage now in the past there used to be this uh, ceremony that there will be a lamp or a shama which would be Uh, because i mean there were no electricity or something so there would be a shama on the stage and the shama or the lamp would be brought in front of each poet uh, as and when their turn came so that is how uh, we uh, you know the, the poet would know that their turn has come now that uh, in a way i found out in some of the committees that there is a person who is responsible for this shama also even though there is no shama but uh, usually before the start of every po- uh, you know uh, mushaira they would uh, light a lamp and 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 kind of initiate uh, the ceremony now uh, the one interesting question when we are talking about the popularity of a phenomenon like uh, uh, youtube mushaira is that how is it that uh, if we go back a little bit in the history uh, if we look at the early 20th century or uh, um, middle of 20th century we realized that 1947 when the partition happened urdu went through a, a very difficult times uh, because a large number of schools and colleges in in india stopped teaching urdu and then people just assume that urdu belong to muslims and therefore if, if they have gone to pakistan so urdu urdu doesn't belong in india and therefore uh, uh, you know there is an entire generation of people in india who were not taught urdu and they were devoid of that yet uh, and also there was a political kind of a, a turn that you know a lot of people just assume that urdu you know urdu doesn't belong to india and and therefore it belongs to only muslims yet i consider uh, i found that uh, the mushairas continue to to remain popular and not only remain popular they uh, the popularity has increased after 1947 many more mushairas are being um organized and so on and many more people are coming in many po- people and these are people who don't know urdu they can't read or write urdu but still they come to um, uh, mushairas i mean i happened to be in some of the mushairas for example in punjab and up and i was amazed that the, um, the the kind of appreciation that people have in these rural areas or 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 cities or towns where you would not find too many muslims but uh, the mushairas are organized and people come there and they they appreciate the poetry and they they do the daad uh, daad dena you know to appreciate or to um, uh, you know like the poetry the, the same way as any urdu literary person would so that is one very interesting um, you know phenomenon that even if we uh, decide that urdu doesn't build, you know urdu is not thriving uh, uh, you know much but the mushairas have kept it alive and another interesting thing is that i found that um, the, along with the mushairas there is also sometimes a combined uh, event which is like mushaira plus kavi sammelan so both of them happen together therefore the hindi and the urdu poets come together and the most interesting part is in the small towns the mushairas are held at um, and i'm not talking about the big towns like you know somebody just commented jashne rehta i'm not talking about the big towns or the dubai mushairas i'm talking about the small town mushairas the small town mushairas traditionally happened at the time of a uh, a, a local rural event like the agricultural fair or um, or something like a even a cattle fair cattle fair agricultural fair uh, uh, you know um, industrial fair let me show you couple of slides if i can uh, just to give you an idea of uh, what sort of um so i guess you can watch my slide show so for example in towns like <clears throat> um, aligarh or rampur or uh, meerut 
these are towns where i have seen myself mushairas happening uh, at the time of for example aligarh state industrial and agricultural exhibition or some other kind of exhibition which is called the numaish you know numaish is this numaish is this exhibition thing which happens in aligarh rampur and many other towns uh, amroha and uh, so people are coming there and there are all kinds of things happening there is dance there is popular music there is cinema there is food and along with that at least uh, in one of the nights there is a mushaira and and these mushairas happen throughout the night and these are the places where people you know you will find farmers coming in and and uh, you know enjoying the mushaira or or any ordinary person would come there and the biggest uh, shires come there so you you will have uh and uh, they're sponsored by big names uh, you know in newspapers or the local local business uh, people who are sponsoring them of course uh, poets like uh, rahat indori and shabina adib and you know uh, abdul ghaffar all these people have been uh, visiting so there is an entire there is a there is like a you can say i call them superstars of of mushaira so there is a whole gallery of people a, a galaxy of people who are the superstars of mushaira they would always visit uh, these numaish or the mushairas there are even uh, something like an all india mahila mushaira and kavitri sammelan so very interesting things are happening in these local places which um, many people in the big towns don't know uh, so i mean big towns we only hear in in cities like delhi we hear about rehta or um, some other uh, jashne basant and all those big mushairas happen and those happen uh, they don't really become an internet um, kind of um, cult but these small towns mushairas are becoming internet uh, cult Uh, now i'm going to show you some of the youtube uh, screenshots which just to give you an idea of what sort of uh, if you search for something like um, uh, you know mushaira or indian mushaira on on youtube you will find all these names uh, gule safa and uh, ahmed bashir and danish ghazal and many many of them uh, dil khairabadi tabish rehan um, and almost every mushaira they they try to make it an or either an all india mushaira or an international mushaira all india mushaira means that you have participation from different states international mushaira could be a mushaira where people from abroad have come and sometimes there is an indo pakistan mushaira india and pakistan mushaira that also happens but the local mushaira are all um, you know like they would always invite a couple of people who are um, uh, sort of uh, you know from the big league and then some of the smaller uh, people now there is a video i'll try to play it if you can hear the audio fine otherwise then uh, i would request you to, maybe if uh, if somebody from the students could play so let me just teen sher us ghazal ke padhti hu jo baar baar aap mujhse sunte hain ki khamosh lab hai aaha jhukke hain pal ke aaha दिलों में उल्फत नई नई है खामोश लब है झुके हैं पल के दिलों में उल्फत नई नई है अभी तकल्फ है गुफ्तगु में अभी मोहब्बत नई नई खामोश लब है झुके हैं पलके दिलों में उल्फत नई नई है कि जरा सा कुदरत ने क्या नवाजा जरा सा कुदरत ने क्या नवाजा के आके बैठे हो पहली सफ में ये पीछे वाले बहुत खुश हो रहे हैं ओ माय गॉड मैंने अपने शेर में अपने शौरा को शरीक किया है आप इसका ख्याल रखें अच्छा लगा मुझे आप बहुत अच्छा आप बढ़िया है। लोग तो समझ गए जरा सा कुदरत ने क्या नवाजा के आके बैठे हो पहली सफ में अभी से नहीं, नहीं, नहीं। वाह 
भाई कमाल कर दिया कमाल कर दिया um were you able to hear the sound uh, can somebody tell me yes sir it was yes. perfectly audible okay okay great that's that's good that's good i was worried that maybe you were not able to hear the sound no, so sir. so that that mushaira was actually from dubai i wanted to you know show you what the dubai mushaira looks like in fact even in dubai there are several kinds of mushairas that are uh, happening now and there are many sponsors available and um, every shair or shaira in india uh you know their desire is to reach dubai if they have reached dubai then then you know they have conquered the world so 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 that was uh, um, you know if you are, if you haven't been to dubai or if you have been to dubai then you would be invited everywhere and if you haven't been to dubai then uh, then you are not a great poet you know so so, uh, so it's a very interesting thing that a lot of poetry a lot of poets are being judged by the 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 kind of poet uh, mushairas they have already uh, done or uh, the their kind of dramatic way of presenting you know their shouting and their singing and those kind of style rather than the quality of their poetry or the rather than the the, the lyrics that they are writing so i mean a, a lot of critics have talked about this that um are, are they really doing any good poetry good literature or is it just um you know like uh, uh the dramatic kind of uh, performance so anyway um, one of the common things which i find a very uh, uh, um popular mushaira uh, theme is the natiya mushaira or the mushairas which are meant for uh which are supposed to be uh, you know the poetry is about uh, the prophet muhammad uh, and and the praise for him the nats are are read out uh, a lot of religious poetry is also being read out in some of these and let me tell you that these uh, mushairas are not necessarily uh, dominated by muslims that you may find non muslims also for example this image that i am showing you there is a name called gyanu singh Uh, who is supposed to be a uh, you know a poet who has uh, who has read poetry uh, in a natiya uh, mushaira um then um, um it's it's it i really get fascinated by the kind of um, range of poetry that is being read out and being liked by people by being appreciated by people and being shared amongst each other so apart from the youtube you can also visit other social media platforms like uh what's uh, uh, facebook where there are similar kind of pages and groups that have been made for uh, mushaira uh, um, appreciation and there are many companies uh, video um, uh, video coverage companies which are actually Uh, promoting or rather using uh, uh, these mushairas i mean they go from one place to another they they make a they make a calendar of where all the mushairas are happening and and they book the mushairas i mean you it's very interesting how the entire dynamic of the industry is working so there is a committee which is organizing the mushaira and then there is a company the video coverage company which is kind of looking out for the mushairas happening and they book a mushaira there okay this particular mushaira we are going to cover don't don't give it to anyone else and they do it probably free although there is some money involved i mean when when the committee organizes a mushaira uh, they have the money they get the sponsorship they get the money to uh, uh, to plan the whole thing to uh, to 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 do the pandal and the hospitality and the audio system and food and everything but who is going to do the video coverage um, because video coverage is not just one camera video coverage of course in the very local small mushairas there could be just one camera but in the big mushairas it has to be a, a big uh, you know several like multi camera setup which is being switched uh, at a switcher or maybe edited uh, later it's like uh, you know the way there is an audio system there is an audio uh, uh, you know there is a there's a audio switcher uh, a mixer sitting there who's mixing all the microphones 
there's a video switcher also who's, who's doing that and sometimes the video coverage people are also showing the mushaira on a big screen uh, for the audience because if the audience could be very big they are doing a, a, a video showing on the screen and a, a live uh, a live youtube or a live facebook directly going to the internet and then people more people watching it and then making a recording and then sharing it further so it's a huge industry and not too many companies like for example here you can see there is a something called mushaira media there's a company then there's a jk mushaira media and uh, there is uh, azmi mushaira media uh, this mushaira media is very popular in fact there are two of them so they keep uploading a whole lot of them and then within like four days you get uh, 4000 uh, views uh, of their of their uh, media and then um, also very interesting i mean if you've seen youtube how youtube works when you upload something you are uh, you have to uh, invite people, you have to make it attractive enough. So um, the, the picture which comes, uh, uh, what is called, uh, you know, like a, a thumbnail of the video has to be attractive enough to uh, get more viewers. So for example, uh, so there is a, uh, there is a thumbnail which says, Mushaire ko lagaye chand, char chand, Kaleem Tariq Saidan Puri. So they will give the name of the poet, maybe a picture of the poet, and then they will write something, maybe some some exciting kind of a title. So, for example, the uh, of course there are child, uh, you know, there are children who are doing poetry and reading out. So this one says, "Is bache ne kya khubsurat naat padhi noton ki barish ho gayi." People are also giving out money to to some of the. Uh, poets uh, but especially the the children uh, you know the child poets not to everyone they don't give money like on stage they would never do that uh, you know uh, money to of course um, in smaller towns when there is a mushaira especially natiya mushaira religious mushaira when somebody is reading out a nath uh, some people come and give money to uh, that person but otherwise um, uh, you know the big poets are not given money like that you it's it doesn't look nice so uh, so so many of these companies are promoting and then uh, jk mushaira there is a mushaira mehfil company for example this one says ishkiya shairi sunkar bihar wale jhoom uthe or this one says lok diwane ho jayenge jab hum zulfe bikhrayenge so there is also a, a very um, you know attracting by these very sensuous kind of pictures on the thumbnail very sensuous kind of uh, poetry uh, written on the thumbnail which attracts more people because they are these companies are concerned that their their, their uh, videos should be watched more more often uh, the more people watch it the more they will get advertisements and more revenue and so on so it's an entire industry which is working here so my question was really uh, that how how does it uh, you know if we are talking about digital humanities and how uh, the digital technology and online technology is affecting the poetry or literature or or the writing of the poetry um, I looked at all these and I, I as I said that there are there is a two way process Mushaira is a two way process and the internet is adding the third way to it the third dimension to it so that is one so i mean we are not just talking about the writing of poetry we are talking about an entire culture an entire literary culture which has evolved over the years and if you look at the the, the technology the media which has evolved in the especially in the 20th century and how the media affected our culture or our especially our uh, performative uh, traditions, performative culture, because I consider Mushaira as a performative art rather than just uh, literary art. It's not just that you write poetry and thousands of people, millions of people are writing poetry, but they're not, uh, you know, just writing a poetry is not literature. You also have to see where it goes, who watches, who, who listens to your poetry and how they react, how they give you Mushaira is a performative tradition, two-way uh, process, two-way performative tradition, and the internet is adding adding this third dimension to it, and uh, um, it is making it more and more popular, more and more, um, you know, the Urdu itself is becoming more and more popular. I mean, I get amazed that 
um, I mean, looking at the Urdu literature and Urdu world, the people who are so-called Urdu walas, um, especially those who are sitting in these big institution, you know, whatever Tarakki, uh, whatever, you know, academies and all those things, uh, all those institutions which are supposed to be promoting Urdu literature and Urdu poetry, they have completely ignored this phenomenon, this, this popularity phenomenon. They, they, they consider uh, these kind of local small town mushairas as something which is not to be taken seriously. And, and this, um, this word meari uh, or standard uh, poetry, uh, they are too much stuck with that, that, uh, you know, they think, what is being performed in these mushairas is uh, they, they use the word chichora, chichori shairi, and the, the way the women are coming and performing and the way they are dressed and so on and so forth. Um, so they, they don't really take it seriously. But the point is, the fact is that um, uh, lakhs of people are watching these videos and they are being affected by the poetry and they're... Please, why? I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry? I'm requesting you to please wind up because we need time for discussion also. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, so that, that's what I'm just coming to that. Uh, I'm not going to show you any more videos because I mean, you can just go and watch some of the videos. They're very, very interesting videos. I didn't show you some of the, what I call the Chichora uh, things. Uh, I mean, they're, they're really amazing. Uh, if you allow me just uh, maybe before I end, uh, I could show you just one video. Uh, um, uh, yeah, this one. I'll just show you one video and then I'll... Inko photo khich ke ne dijiye. Acha photo khich dijiye. Photo inko khich ke ne dijiye. Matlab, yaha ye meri photo khichinge aur ghar par inki wife ki koi aur photo khich raha. Arre bhai ye. Hamare JK, JK media wale, Mushara media wale. और माशाल्लाह मुशायरा मीडिया मुजीद भाई भी हमारे तशरीफ लाए हुए हैं ये दोनों कैद कर रहे हैं माशाल्लाह ये लो जी बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया और मैं चार मिसरे आप तक पहुंचाती हूं कितनी चाहत है मुझसे मेरे हम नशे वाह हाय 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 अरे वाह वाह कितनी चाहत है मुझसे हम नशे तूने मुझको बताया मजा आ गया हाजी मंजूर साहब ये हैं खैराबाद के लोग I just wanted to show you you know one example of what what really what what is you know the most popular way of so so these women would come dressed in an interesting way and then the kind of poetry there there's also an influence of Bollywood songs as you could see from this and these 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 mushairas are really appreciated so just to end I mean just I wanted to mention this that. Uh, the popularity of Urdu language, I mean, it, Urdu is really thriving, Urdu poetry is really thriving in, in these kind of um, uh, spaces, whether it's the physical space of the Mushaira or whether it's the, 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 uh, the, uh, the internet, the, the cyber space where this is thriving. And most of the Urdu people, the Urdu literary people, they're, not, they're, they're either not aware of this or they're ignoring it totally. But the point is that... Uh, if, if you try to maintain that mayar or, or the standard of poetry, the poetry will remain, of course, in a, in a certain secluded uh, kind of space, whether it's an academic space or, of course, the mushairas are also held in, in very small gatherings, small mehfils where maybe just 10 people would be there and, and uh, only some of the elite uh, poets uh, will be able to read out. Um, but then that will be an elite thing and that will be a very secluded thing. It doesn't make uh, that poetry popular. But I think it's these mushairas or these kind of spaces, uh, the sharing of, of these recordings all over the world, um, and we, especially in the small towns, that is keeping the uh, Urdu alive and keeping the poetry alive and also uh, evolving newer ways of thinking how to respond to this kind of a thing. A lot of new poets are coming. A lot of poets have said that we are we are writing poetry after watching some of the mushairas and we would like to participate in some of the mushairas. So that way I'm very hope, hopeful that uh, these this phenomenon is keeping the mushairas uh, and the poetry alive 
whether you you know you can keep on debating whether it it, it, may, it maintains a standard or not so that's how i would like to uh, conclude this thank you thank you yusuf sir for uh, creating in an interest in a small town uh, mushaira especially available on youtube uh, i would directly pass it on to the rapporteur to take up questions as we have very little time thank you ma'am uh, thank you very much sir once again for a very very interesting talk uh, i'll read the questions uh, in one go because they are more or less related and then maybe you can come in in the end uh, so first thing is that do you think um, yes so uh, one of our participants rohan uh, has mentioned that he did some field work in 2018 in doda jammu and kashmir and he found an entire industry where shops sold mushaira videos on a usb stick or a mobile phone because the internet speed is not that great there so have you also come across such instances in your uh, instances of circulation in your research as well uh that is one then uh we have that have you done any quantitative analysis or some other analysis to argue that small town musharas have a better presence on youtube than the more popular like the rekta ones uh also i mean related to this only that has there been any systematic study of you know these companies done you know or any one in particular to give a more accurate picture of the mushaira industry uh, then also that whether this kind of research uh, can be an example of digital ethnography uh, especially when a researcher wants uh, to answer questions pertaining to the audience perhaps through comments under those videos which are uh, written on youtube then uh, we have a comment from uh, professor nishat heather where she says that uh, when we talk of uh, mayor then the debate seems to be limited to the discussion of male shires only uh, the women poets are supposed to provide voyeuristic relief uh, during the late hours of the night uh, when the heavy poetry tends to make audiences uh, remail drowsy and if pole dancing can be considered an art then this too can pass off as art quote and quote but don't you think that it does disservice to urdu instead of doing any good and it is not urdu poetry it is voyeurism packaged as performative art if the loud and bawdy dards made by the fellow male poets are something to go by then it leaves very little to imagination it is nothing but soft pornography uh, i'm not a purist but this is neither urdu uh, nor uh, shairi and we have another comment which says that the project uh, the research that you talked about also is true for the dairo if i'm reading it correctly a kind of a musical concert seen in parts of gujarat and related to this only i had my own question that if you are probably aware of the bhagwa music or what is now popularly known as hindutva pop music i have been working on this particular brand of uh, popular music for quite some time now and it also has millions of viewers and uh, dedicated youtube channels on it and rather this was my question that these you know popular mushairas do they also have proper uh, you know recording and performances done just for the sake of uploading because this is the case that is being noticed in the hindutva pop music where they have recording companies labels and channels who perform just so that it can be recorded and uploaded uploaded on youtube and they have millions and millions of viewers so over to you sir yeah thank you i'll try to uh, reply um, as quickly as possible so as far as the uh, uh, kind of a statistical data or some kind of a uh, ethnographic data is concerned uh, this is just a beginning of my research i don't know i, I mean i was looking at uh, you know if, if anybody else has tried to do this kind of a research but i could not really find but i have been over the years i have been looking at popular media i mean started with the cassette you know if you if you know the cassette culture uh, um, that that book which uh, um, one scholar has written so uh, following that then videos and vcds and uh, you know dvds and and coming to the internet so i have done some research on that but this particular thing i'm just new to it and i haven't really done a statistical research but i could at least look at the you know the number of views uh, from from the youtube and 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 that was something amazing and that really attracted me and then the companies that are 
doing this uh, thing and since i am myself involved in in some of the youtube i mean i am myself i have a youtube channel so i i know how it works and how you can earn revenues and so on and so forth so i mean it's just a beginning maybe you can call it a work in progress so i mean i would love to do more on this maybe if i finalize a paper based on this then i would uh, like to include some of the statistics in it but yeah it's a fascinating uh, thing um and and i am more interested in um, in really the small town uh, mushairas because that that is my uh, concern now as far as the uh, the the the, the mayor question is concerned and and the uh, you know how uh, definitely though the, these uh, female poets who are being invited um they are uh, you know they're just doing a dramatic kind of an appearance the poetry is not so important i mean uh, each of these poets uh, poetess they come off you know straight from a maybe a beauty saloon or something to come to this and dressed in a very attractive way and and their poetry is also akin to what you call bollywood or or uh, you know that that voyeurism uh, thing is definitely there but let me also tell you that um uh, these are just uh, snippets from the entire uh, recording let's say if if there is a, a five hour long mushaira then out of that there will be they, they they try to keep a range of poets they 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 keep some very pop, uh, some very famous and uh, uh, the mayari the so called mayari poets they they keep people like uh, you know rahat indori or or somebody like that they would have that and along with them they would have uh, you know these young girls coming in and performing and i have also seen that people like rahat indori or um, imran pratap gadi are sitting there and they are also know they know that you know this girl or this this woman uh, is being brought in to attract the audience Uh, uh but we will also you know come up with our uh, so there is a there is a kind of a tension which i see in all the recordings there's a tension which is going on uh, between the so called mayari or the the more standardized poets and these kind of a things uh so there is a, always an emphasis on bringing the narrative from that popular and voyeuristic thing to the more standard like even the convener the person the, who is doing the nizamat of the mushaira he would continue to say okay now uh, enough of this now let's move on to this or if the poetry or the, the mushaira is getting very serious then he'd say oh enough of the seriousness now let's move on to a lighter uh, thing so it's like you know i i consider that as like a movie you know in a movie when there is a serious scene then they they break that seriousness to bring a you know a, a song and dance sequence or something like that so i mean i would say that the entire mushaira is a popular culture uh, performative uh, phenomenon and uh, to define whether it is doing any service or disservice to urdu yeah that's a big question uh, that's a big question um, but then uh, i i suppose urdu language plays that role of you know a wide range i don't think there's any other language or any other phenomenon in our in in south asia which can play that such a wide uh, role that on one hand it 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 uh, pleases the uh, elite uh, intellectuals uh, who are listening to ghalib and meer and and sauda and on the other hand they can listen to shabina adib and 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 you know things like that so um, um it is it is a medium i i would say the language is a medium which which can play both these role i guess thank you sir a uh, follow up question is that is this unique to india unlike pakistan where we have more serious me, uh, mayari mushaira uh, mushaira women poets yeah you can say that you can say that but you know even in in pakistan the these uh, agricultural fairs and cattle fairs happen and and let me tell you in the cattle fairs and agriculture fairs in pakistan uh, there's another separate study that i have done on that there are classical music concerts which happen ghazal gaiki and khayal and tumri those things happen in pakistan near lahore so there are standards there also it's not mushaira maybe not so much because you know pakistan um, urdu is not really 
a, a you know a local language of pakistan very honestly urdu is just a language of the people who migrated from india so in punjab you you know punjabi or sindhi or balochi or other languages are more popular in terms of the local folk uh, literature so urdu is there but uh, i think it's a very elite language in pakistan i would say it's not such a uh, maybe it, it 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 goes into qawali or ghazal gaiki that's the only place where it, where, where it, it reaches the popular uh, people but uh, not in terms of literary i think they are still trying to maintain that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, standard or mayar more but but in india it has a different connotation i think in in the local areas i, I really think that it is uh, popularizing that um, so i mean there is a range of things that are happening you will get the popular side and then you will get the more literary and intellectual side yes thank you thank you very much sir once again for such a uh, reflective and thought provoking talks always you make us think about our own research ideas and research methodologies and research interests so thank you once again very much sir and now i hand over the mic to professor zaidi to introduce our next speakers of the session thank you thank you yusuf saab for this fascinating uh, talk on uh, mushairas in small towns uh, i'm sure all of us have many more questions but we will keep it for uh, for the next occasion whenever we get to meet you so now i invite professor nirmala menon uh, who is as we all know uh, with iit indore uh, most of us who are who have recently entered the field of digital humanities know and appreciate nirmala for uh, for her stupendous work that she has done in creating and promoting <clears throat> digital humanities alliance in research and teaching innovation that is dharti and dharti is really really doing wonderful work so uh, so we all all credits to nirmala and other scholars associated with dharti nirmala is the author of migrant identities of creole cosmopolitans transcultural narratives of contemporary post coloniality uh then she has another book called remapping the post colonial canon remap reimagine retranslate uh, she has published widely and she has worked in the area of digital humanities gender studies globalization and translation studies but for me uh, i admire her most for the leadership that she has provided to digital humanities in india and not only in a, by by her own work but also in creating a, a whole community of scholars who are doing excellent work and we really look up to uh, you know uh, not just her own work but also the works of a scholar so so great having you nirmala i welcome you here and uh, over to you now thank you thank you nishat and it's lovely to be here and i also want to thank uh, dr yusuf for stepping in uh, because we had a simultaneous event at my institute where i was required to speak for a few minutes <laughs> uh, so thank you for you know accommodating that and thank you nishat so i will you know uh, start can i start sharing my screen yes so uh, actually what i'm going to present today is as nishar pointed out you know work which i've done with my students so electronic literature is one area which you know all my publications or all our publications are with work that is done by my students one of who is presenting in this conference tomorrow i think and uh, what we have tried to look at is you know uh this the stock as well as this work is partly inspired by my friend and uh, fellow scholar shovik mukherjee who is also coming and uh, talking tomorrow uh, his uh, article from a very good journal that said you know no india is no country for elite right so this was published in 2017 uh late 2016 or 17 and at that time you know i kind of looked at that article and clearly you know shovik makes some really wonderful points there uh and it made me thinking as you know yusuf sab just pointed out you know this is a country that is very literal you know we have all forms of poetry writing from you know ancient times till now so wh- why did we miss the bus on electronic literature you know what happened and what is what why is it that there is not enough being produced in electronic uh, uh, in the electronic realm or is that even true so you know so our question was it was more of a hypothesis taken off of from shuvik's uh, article 
to kind of examining that and we came up with really kind of you know interesting uh, uh, interesting uh, kind of you know uh, answers and i will share some of that with you you know a detailed account you will see in the paper that you know i'm writing for nishat but uh, i'll just let me just share the screen Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint now? Uh, yes, ma'am. We we can see it. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so this is like you know. So, what is electronic literature? Where is it? Does it even exist? This is really kind of the basic question that we started with, right? Now, uh, what? Uh, you know uh, what we find is that in india we have three different versions of electronic literature one is you know the digital versions of print texts texts converted from the print format to electronic and then disseminated on the internet digitally published texts and then born digital works right so digitally published texts are also born digital but you know they very much mirror what we see in print the only difference being that you're reading it on an electronic device or you're reading it on a uh, you know on your tablet or any other electronic or e forms right and the born digital works are also ones that kind of uh, you know combine multimedia and yeah. also you have like you know yusuf sab pointed out you know uh, things like mushairas that are performative you have like kind of you know in uh, in in kerala you have this uh, Uh, thing called you know akshara shlokam which is kind of an antakshari with poetry yeah. which is a big you know which is a big thing in kerala has always been there but now has kind of changed into digital format so you know you are having these kind of online interactions and what you found what i found or what we found is that in india you know electronic literature absolutely yes it does exist right now uh the question is you know if it does exist why is it that the three volumes of electronic literature produced elo volume 1 volume 2 and volume 3 does not contain a single work from india right uh, so that anthology really does not exist uh, uh at all partly maybe because of our reach because of the fact that a lot of work that is being done in india is being done within communities small communities uh of practice where they kind of exchange it uh, we are i'll talk about that a little later but we are trying to kind of bring that together now and uh, and it is disseminated within those communities sometimes making it across some regional borders but often times not so much right and i think the reason that happens is also is very unique to india that most of our writers artists creative uh, authors are not you know looking for bigger audiences because suppose you are writing something in tamil or you are writing in kannada right there is you know a million people who are reading it right so if you look if you compare that with publishing statistics around the world well that's a pretty good audience <laughs> right and so that compulsion of kind of you know making it global that imperative uh, has not yet happened i think it will it is coming we can see many examples of it now and the second thing is that a lot of it is multilingual which is so rich it's so textured uh, and because of that multilinguality uh, which you would think in an electronic form is an advantage is partly one of the reasons why perhaps it has not gotten a global notice right uh, which kind of takes us back to the old debates about you know indian writing in english versus indian writing in other languages i don't want to revisit that argument but you know i do think that it is important to recognize that these are the different formats of electronic literature in india there are purists in electronic literature who only think that some form of multimedia are the ones that can be you know uh, that can be considered elite i belong to a school where i feel that especially from the global south we should not really be uh, wedded to any forms of quote unquote authenticity 
quote unquote serious non serious right i think you know uh, why why do art forms exist you know why do literature exist literature exists for an audience it is speaking to a readership it's speaking to a uh, uh, you know someone who wants to consume that right and even though the penetration of uh, digital in india has expanded exponentially uh, and I, uh, you know i have some statistics in the report uh, in the paper that i'm writing but uh, you know according to many official sources almost 560 million people in india have access to some form of you know uh, 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 digital uh, internet right however the the nuance there is that a majority of that except for a very uh, small percentage has that access through a very um, through a basic smartphone or not a smartphone right so in other words you know the platforms that are available to them are not uh, that sophisticated uh, combined with the fact because the structures and infrastructures are so closely uh, you know uh, integrated right and uh, the bandwidth that is available is again not uh, you know to to the extent that might be available in other places and so our authors or our writers respond to that in that way and therefore all these different versions to me are legitimate electronic uh, electronic literature right <laughs> you know digital translations uh, digital translations have become really very interesting because you have both machine translations manual translations machine interfaces with manual translations there are many combinations of that uh that are being kind of you know circulated in uh, in india literary games i know very little about literary games i've just seen a few which are text driven and uh, they are interesting one of the earlier ones that i have actually tinkered with is the twine uh, platform which allows you to create your own story you know it allows you to kind of you know pick your characters then you know decide what that character wants to do and then you know you kind of create your story uh, accordingly so that was one of the earlier ones my students tell me that there are more sophisticated ones today you know i think me as well as all of you should check those out uh, and uh, uh, what the um, my, you know my student shanmuga priya you know in her dissertation when we were doing her dissertation work we also kind of uh, looked at uh, Uh, R.K. Narayan's, uh, 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 the vendor of sweets, right? In which he actually has a story writing machine. You know, so in you know the story writing machine, he imagines it to be where you know you can actually it has a knob. He actually has a picture of it, which has a knob which shows different emotions, which has like you know different. So in some ways, you know, he has imagined that. which we now seem to tinker with on the web right in some form of electronic literature right so uh, so the thought of having a machine or the thought of technology generating stories uh, is not in itself new right uh, and um, uh, simultaneously i think the history of literature shows that every time you know when we move from the scroll to the novel you know you are moving from the materiality of the uh, scroll as a manuscript to you know the gutenberg press and the printing press so the materiality has often has always allowed you know authors to find new ways of you know engaging with it and i don't think it is very different in india i just think that we have not anthologized it or you know kind of uh, looked at it enough now one of the things that you see is this electronic literature initiatives so one is the epustakalai.com you can go check it out tamil ebooks project madurai dc books online you know, these are all kind of places where you can read as well as interact and someone asked that question about you know looking at comments and trying to kind of analyze you know how reader responds is to the mushayiras right and i think that is one of the things that you can do with uh, these kind of uh, uh, resources also i think you know uh, uh, many of these uh, corpus of literature allows us to create you know ocr and reading technologies for these scripts too which also is something that in digital humanities we really need to work on right and uh, this is creating that corpus now you know you are seeing a lot of these books you also have other interactive forms but these are basically just e books 
And having those e-books allows you to say, for example, text mine them for you know uh, analysis, critically read them, close reading, distant reading, you know, all of those uh, 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 tools that you use in digital humanities can be used for these languages. Those tools now have to be tweaked to keep up with the corpus of work that you see online. Right? So, you know, uh, uh, one of the th uh, things that we noticed is that, you know, unlike in Western literature, many of the electronic literature work are short stories, yeah, or rather than uh, poetry, even though there is a lot of poetry, you know, there is a lot of like, you no know, short stories. So I think you're seeing a combination of, you know, the oral, the textual, and the performative. Yeah. And if you look at the history of uh, Indian literatures, I think that's a very, there's a very uh, natural kind of sinking between these forms, right? And yeah. oh, uh, there is uh, different regions in the country, for example, you know, uh, read poetry in particular ways, right? In, uh, in Malayalam poetry, you know, you read poetry uh, in consonance with the ragas. You know, so certain uh, poetry is read, certain kinds of poetry or genres of poetry are read in particular ways. Urdu poetry also, you know, has that. So, you know, in some ways you find the electronic literatures mirroring those, you know, mirroring those forms. And then in some cases, you know, pushing it to, uh, to uh, different uh, boundaries. Right. So what, some of the examples of that is Valmiki, Indulekha.com, Pustakalai, Nale Uta. These are, you know, Malayalam ones. We found that Malayalam, Bengali and Marathi uh, and then Hindi and Uriya seem to be the most active in terms of languages uh, with respect to electronic literature. Pratilipi.com, I highly recommend all of you to go check it out. It is an amazing platform. And uh, it actually puts, you know, the one, the image I have on the left is from pratilipi.com. You have all of these languages and um, uh, uh, works in these languages. Uh, what I like about this platform, and I think this is where the digital offers us a conversation that perhaps a print uh, does not, especially in our ecosystem uh, and our educational kind of structure, where you have a Hindi department and you have a English department and they don't really talk to each other, you know, oftentimes, right? And so this, what this platform does is, you know, it brings works from all these different languages. And suppose, you know, I know Malayalam and Hindi, you know, and English, there's a way for me to kind of, you know, put these works in conversation with each other, you know, and try to see if there is some kind of, you know, uh, text mining that I can do before I do a close reading. So, you know, um, I find that an absolutely fascinating, um, um, you know, endeavor, and it is put together by twelve or thirteen very young people. You know, many of them engineers actually, you know, who are interested in reading and interested in literature. So again, you kind of see, you know, that marriage of technology and 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 literature. So you know, uh, the born digital works are interactive fiction, flash fiction, and poetry, generative fiction or poetry. Uh, this is, I, I don't think audio books is quite the right way to put this, you know, yesterday, since we were doing this last moment, uh, but I wanted to explain that. I, when I say audio books, I don't really mean audio books as we know it in the West, which is that, you know, when a book is published, oftentimes the author or someone else that the author approves of reads the entire text. And then, you know, you can listen to it while you're driving or, you know, so that's kind of the concept of audio books, right? Whereas, you know, the uh, examples that I will show you here are actually, you know, applications where, you know, uh, they kind of tell you stories, you kind of respond to it. And then, you know, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole narrative that is formed. So it is not necessarily like a given text in a very predetermined form, but it is a far more dynamic kind of application. You know? So uh, I have to find a better word to, uh, you know, to uh, describe that. But slam literature, social media writings, you know, I think these are all usually, you know, uh, standard or you know, recognized as electronic literature by Ka Catherine Hales and other scholars. Um, uh, the three, you know, in Malayalam and Tamil is Kelkam. Kelkam literally means let's let's listen. You know? And so it's like I said, you know, it's not audio as in a passive form, but uh, it's more an active form of, you know, let's listen together. 
all right and then you know let's respond and let's kind of you know uh, talk about it audible storytell these are all kind of you know forms of multi uh, multilingual uh, electronic literature and you will find that all of these applications some of them like i said kelkam is mostly malayalam and tamil but you know one of the things that you notice like with prathilipi is that in india you know something starts off with malayalam and tamil because the three people who come together perhaps know those three two languages right but then that platform usually widens it usually broadens tell me a story by koral das gupta is another example which i think is a great one yeah. where then you know you find that even pratilipi you know started off with just bengali and tamil and malayalam i think and now has you know 13 languages so you kind of see that uh, multilinguality as being so um, uh, organic in the in the production of electronic literature in india and multilingual Orga uh, as organic is also slightly more advanced than in print versions. Partly because I find that you know people often time move between say you know uh, Malayalam and Tamil or you know say uh, Kannada and Marathi, uh, not always necessarily uh, going through a medium of English, right? Which seems to have become a kind of a standard medium for our translations. post 1980 right where you know when you look at translation of literary works you kind of see english has become a conduit between bengali and uh, and malayalam right uh, so i find that that is a step that you know uh, um, that is skipped uh, in in these in these kind of you know uh, electronic lit uh, uh, examples and that to me is absolutely you know uh, it is fascinating because we have always assumed that you need a median language right that you know to kind of talk and you realize that no so it also reminds me of sheldon pollock uh, and his notion of the uh, cosmopolis right uh, am i running out of time nishan uh, nisha no 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 you still have okay <laughs> yeah. yeah i thought the expression on your face was like you need to hurry up <laughs> <laughs> sorry i was <laughs> <laughs> so you know uh, so this to me seems to me a bit like you know uh, to use a strange uh, technological analogy that you know some of us who grew up in the 90s uh, you know that it was the 90s where you know you moved from the landline phones to the cell phones right and when you know when you had landline phones with my parents you know it was a it was a luxury yeah it was something that you know some homes had you often in a you know in a in a street there will be just one home or two homes that had a phone that everybody else would come and use and you know we have seen that right and then you had the cell phone technology and we leapfrog the technology in other words like you know you did not have to lay the cable lines for all uh, everybody to have access to the landline before we went on to the cell phones and now cell phone is fairly ubiquitous so in some ways you know i see this as analogous to that you know so that where in some ways you suddenly realize that oh you know if you want to look at something in you know there is a way you can talk between kannada and marathi and not really worry about you know uh, the english uh, in between right so uh, i'm not quite sure where i'm going with that because i'm still writing that uh, essay but it 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 kind of you know hits me as being very uh, interesting now these are another like you know examples of electronic literature terribly tiny tales which i always tell my students that the tales are really terrible uh, uh, right now i don't see them as being very sophisticated however yesterday in fact one of my phd students you know she told me that they ha i have gotten better you know so when i first came across terribly tiny tales this was about 4 years ago after that i rarely went back to it because it didn't seem to me to have a however you know i think that also must have you know evolved scribbled stories commas and half stories now this you know um, we are angry.net this is another kind of website which i recently discovered where there's a lot of you know uh, um, i don't know you know language uh, of young people where they use word and image and create poetry and create you know small kind of uh, stories which are just you know very interesting i'm not quite sure what i make of it so far this you know is very interesting this is a bot that was made in malayalam Uh, and it does like you know it just produces poetry 
And this is a bot. Let me look at my notes. I have written down the name. Yeah. Uh, so this was developed by Fabin Rashid, a designer who is based in Bengaluru, and Sliba Paul from Kochi. Uh, and it provides like a, you know, uh, the this Aurea is an AI artist poet. Uh, and it was named on an anagram for AI haiku art. Yeah. Uh, Aurea's inventors explain that we started off trying to create a bot which continuously produced haikus, that is short poems. And we wanted Aurea to create poems which does not make complete sense in the beginning, but will eventually make some sense to some people. Yeah. So, you know, this was just, you know, to me, um, uh, fascinating that, you know, you have uh, a bot like Aurea that is actually producing, uh, producing different poetry and, you know, um, what is going to happen? I mean, it's still very new. Let us see, you know, where they, where they go with that. Yeah. Uh, these are again, some examples, you know, uh, uh, I am not uh, very, um, familiar with the uh, gaming. I, am, I look forward to Shovik's, you know, uh, uh, presentation. I'm sure he will have much more sophisticated analysis of it. But I, I just look at it as literary games. If there are games that actually look at literature, and you know, there are some examples of you know YouTube story slams, you know, Commune, Somewhere, which is an anthology, Olio Mingus, a game design studio. Uh, you know, all of which kind of combine uh, literature and, uh, you know, uh, uh, gaming. Uh, so uh, this, again, is, uh, is something that is um, still in the works. But we try to reach out to, you know, many of these authors who are producing literature, as well as to a community of their readers. And we looked at, like, you know, what is the accessibility of digital literature in regional languages? And we gave them points like, you know, from one to five. Uh, and we found that in many of these languages, you know, a lot of uh, one being the least and five being the most, right? And you found that many people actually not only access digital literature, they find that they do find a lot of content in their languages that they actually like to visit and revisit often. That, you know, this is a, a survey which we did very recently and we are still kind of analyzing the data, so it's not completely there. But uh, we found that response really fascinating, that they found that, you know, you do find, uh, it's especially Oriya was a surprise to us that, you know, the amount of work that is out there, the corpus of works that are available and how much people are accessing it, right? Because, you know, uh, combine that with the e-lit writers who we reached out to about 60 of them, and, you know, so we looked at, you know, what is digital publication for writers? And we found that the extension of print as well as a first-hand publication medium are almost equal. You know, they have the equal kind of, you know, importance for, uh, for writers. And uh, many of them were moved to these platforms for two main reasons. One being that, you know, um, um, you can self-publish get a readership and through that self-publication oftentimes you know the traditional publishers reach out to them right so in some ways you know if there are writers especially from small towns or from people player non-metro metropolitan places who feel they do not have access to the gatekeepers of publishing right they find this a uh, way of you know putting their foot in, you know, and that uh, seemed to be fairly important. And as a first-hand publication uh, medium too, right? So extension of print is like, you know, once you like, you know, the established writers, especially, you know, for example, an Amitav Ghosh, uh, right, who publishes his nth book, and then actually, you know, kind of engages with his readers, with people's comments on social media, on Twitter, you know, responds to them and gives uh, a small YouTube interviews and you know so there is that combination of you know author identity undergoing a change uh, you know um, uh, apart from you know creating electronic uh, literatures right uh, so reasons for digital publication accessibility to readers don't go too much by the percentages because you know they are more like i said we reached out to about 60 people and i think in terms of readers maybe a little bit more than that about 80 or 90 so 
but these reasons were very interesting you know the accessibility interactive reading possibilities lower cost content analysis better engagement portability eco friendly alternative i have a um, colleague in computer science who whenever he travels which none of us have done for the last one year usually will ask me for a recommendation you know that you know what is a book what what book do you recommend right and whatever it is i tell him that you know he usually makes sure that he has it on his tablet so he can read it while he's traveling you know on a flight or something so these are the ways in which in india you know we seem to uh, now reasons for not choosing digital publications you know uh, among many of these reasons the one that i find the most interesting is loss of content over time and i think you know in electronic literature uh, as well as in digital humanities as a as a field this is something that we are still grappling with right the, the materiality of the book has become fairly ubiquitous and most of us have forgotten that the book is a technology was a technology right but now the book is a stable material form and unless there is a fire and it is you know cheap enough that there are multiple copies right so unless you know if there is a fire and it destroys you know the book at the jamia millia library there is often some other library that has the book and so you know uh, you have access to it that stability of materiality is not yet there in electronic forms right so there are actually electronic literature electronic poetry that were produced but now you can't even find them because you know uh, they are not able to sustain so the economics of it uh, and the stability of it still need some work you know and i think you know that is still uh, nascent and um, i think you know probably will get better Yeah, you know, and uh, people, you know, your computer scientists will assure you that once it is there on the web, it's always there. It doesn't really get lost. But then, you know, uh, getting lost and getting erased are two different things, right? So if you can't really retrieve it, or if you or I, who is not a computer scientist, cannot retrieve it, you know, for then for us, in some ways, it is lost, <laughs> right? So, so that I think is something that still needs uh, work, and I think it needs research too. And we don't know where we are going to. uh when you know, we are going with that contentment of having a print version has someone who has a 14 year old daughter i can tell you that you know that just died with our generation you know so they i don't think people really you know care too much uh, kids certainly don't which is not to say that she doesn't pick up a book from my library and also read but that you know she's equally comfortable reading it on the kindle uh as much as reading it in print form you know so uh i think you know that is probably like saying that we want to read a manuscript or you know so this you know i want to kind of end with this but uh, i'm happy to uh, take questions before i go to this i just want to say that you know when catherine hales talks about the uh, print not being the hypertext or the url right and that electronic forms are as valid i think you know i don't i don't think that is a question anymore i think that is true however i also think that when we talk about electronic literature in india we have to keep three things in mind one is the multilinguality you know that it will be in different languages and second is the affordances right that most of the literature that is produced and the platforms that may may be produced in um um you know short films for example which we have seen a real so you know paradigm shift in the sophistication of short films right now, all of that will always be grounded in the fa in the way infrastructure keeps up with its access to a majority of our population and that is how this uh, will move it does not mean in my mind that uh, we do not have the creative artists who cannot think now uh, in forms that are abstract or in forms that you know push boundaries but they will do so at a time when there is uh, uh, there is an audience that their readership can you know engage with it that's my uh, conclusion from trying to understand you know how elit uh, works in india so i would not say that elit uh, you know that it's not a country for elit i would say that it's a country that uh, recognizes diverse modalities of what defines elit you know and i will stop with that i want to say that you know the publishing platform at iit indore knowledge sharing in publishing which is 
and open access, you know, Creative Commons uh, publishing portal. And, you know, um, Yusuf Saab was referring to this, uh, that uh, this, we have put out a call for creating an anthology of electronic literature from India, volume one. And I have given the, uh, I think there is an email description somewhere here. Otherwise I can always share it with uh, Nishat and you can send it over. Anyone, because we expect this to be a multilingual anthology. It will not be a, a single language one. So if you know anyone who wants to contribute, January 5th is our deadline for it. Uh, we already have uh, contributions, but we would really like to see this to be a very rich uh, volume and let that be our kind of, you know, uh, uh, contribution to that conversation of electronic literature globally. That, you know, this is it. Here we are. I would actually have liked this to be South Asian in, you know, getting contributions from uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, but at that time, you know, we were too scared when we, you know, made this and we thought that if we can just get some uh, contributions from India, that would be great. Uh, so I'm open, even if you, you know, if there are people who want to contribute, uh, you can uh, share this too, as well as, you know, um, think of it as, as our first kind of foray into electronic literature. So I'll stop there and, you know, I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nirmala. It was absolutely fascinating. So you began with the total denial position of Shovik, which is very <laughs> <laughs> electronic literature in India. And then, you know, took us through the typology, etc. And finally, to call for paper, which is like hope, opening, possibilities, and so on and so forth. So this was an absolutely fascinating talk. I will pass to uh, Ankita, our rapporteur, to take up questions. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Nirmala, ma'am, for one another you know once again and another enlightening and very fascinating talk so the first question for you is that uh, do you think that while it is important to talk about digital literature uh, what about digital archiving of films because there is an important connection between literature and films which uh, our uh, participant feels needs to be acknowledged and worked upon yeah, I think there is, you know, there are some uh, projects that l look at, you know, archiving of films. What is that? It's called uh, Padma, P A D dot M A, that is a archive, uh, you know, archiving of Indian films. So, absolutely, yes, I do think that you have to think about, you know, uh, um, uh, archiving. Archiving is kind of the basic. Uh, uh, basic first or second step to creating any kind of electronic forms, right? So what we call archiving now is really what I was talking about in terms of, you know, uh, saving the content for posterity. So creating repositories, creating archives and making sure that, you know, that this is available for a future generation is often, you know, um, what is challenging about that is that now it is so closely intertwined with the, uh, infrastructure, right? So you need to be able to know the platforms and the infrastructures for it to make sure that those repositories work the way we want them to. We want them to work, right? So yeah, absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, he also provides the reason of why he asked that question, saying that uh, because there are many multilingual adaptations of Devdas, uh, which are completely inaccessible, uh, inaccessible. For example, PC Barua's adaptation of it in Assamese is not accessible, uh, despite the Hindi versions and even the Bengal Bengali ones have been preserved. So it's just yeah. a follow up. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's a very good question. Partly, this is exactly what I was trying to say, that there is a difference in the languages within the languages, right? So, you know, even when we were looking at electronic literature, you find that languages like Bengali and, you know, Malayalam, Kannada, Marathi, they are far more, um, I won't say advanced, but I think, you know, they are more invested, you know, in ensuring that, you know, that these cultural artifacts are archived and preserved. Uh, whereas, you know, in some other languages, even with a language like Hindi, which you would uh, think, uh, given the resources it has, uh, would be more forthcoming, and yet you find it is slower, 
right? So I'll give you an example of a database project that we are trying to do for Indian literatures in languages other than English uh, and, uh, and create just a bibliography, nothing else, an MLA bibliography, uh, style bibliography, right? And we reached out to many academics, you know, and we still have to kind of form a group for Hindi. We, we have already been able to get people to do Bengali, to do Marathi, you know, Hindi, uh, sorry, uh, Kannada, and I uh, know, so not Kannada, we still have not done Kannada, but Tamil and Malayalam, right? But for Hindi, I'm trying to write, you know, but it's still taking a lot of time. So again, I think it has also something to do with the audiences, right? Yeah. You know, so if you have a mushaira or if you have like, you know, poetry reading in Lucknow or in places that are very known for this, you know, in Banaras or Lucknow and such places, I think, you know, when you find that your face to face audience is just as big, <laughs> you know, that imperative to have like a digital kind of space is not so much. Right. So I think it's, it's really that that kind of, you know, disparity. Whereas, you know, if you look at, say, a Malayali audience or a Bengali audience, a lot of them may not even be in the country. Right. So many of them have traveled abroad or, you know, or in other places, working in other places. So then, you know, one of the ways they want to kind of, you know, uh, engage with, you know, uh, Bengali poetry is through digital interfaces. Right. So, like, you know, the, uh, some of you may have heard, you know, the music festival uh, Maragari in uh, Chennai this year has gone online, right? Now, Maragari is like a, it's a seminal event, you know, every December and uh, people from across the world actually travel to India to be part of that music festival, right? And this year, uh, but all these years, you know, they never made felt that you should make it online because you know the footfall for the uh, you know for the sabas are so huge. You don't really need to have you know also put in the work to put in an online version. This time, because of the pandemic, yeah, you know, they have now made it completely online. And what they are saying is that you know that the record there are record registrations because there are like registrations from across the globe. So they they are actually struggling with how to manage that. So sometimes, you know, it is these kind of moments that help happen, right? <laughs> yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is that uh, how about uh, Instagram poetry and the Rupee core phenomena? I mean, the same question of the standards exist there as in small town Musharas as well. Mm, yeah, you know, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about this. The thing is, you know, I have always found whenever we look at, say, you know, um, uh, theory as well as, you know, practice of uh, literature down the ages, uh, whenever we think about, you know, uh, creating a certain um, evaluation or assessment of, you know, that this is good poetry or this is not good poetry or this is, you know, you often, we often end, get the short end of the stick, both as, you know, participants from the global south, then again, you know, doubly, you know, as women, you know, as, you know, say minority or marginalized communities. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I keep hearing from, uh, uh, you know, from my, uh, from maybe, you know, part of my community or part of my family in Kerala is a Ma'am, we can't hear. But you. often with a tinge of they don't understand what is happening, what what the young people are writing about, and and don't relate to that, right? So for me, it is always that you know, whether it is Instagram poetry or Twitter, you know, Twitter stories. Um, yes, I agree that you know they don't start off um, uh, with the, uh, with the kind of a power excellence examples, but at some point we'll see them see you know push that. And you'll see the production of something that is really kind of, you know, all of us will agree that, oh, that's a great piece of work, right? So, so that, that threshold will happen in any of these uh, formats. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the next question is that uh, how the advent of uh, digital humanities can engage with or mm. 
enable or impact the third world feminist studies, both in theory and praxis. I mean, if you can talk about this with relation yeah. to radical yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, I mean, I don't think I can speak um, as, I mean, you know, Radhika Gajala is just an amazing uh, theorist. And I think, you know, how can I, there is so much work to be done in feminist studies, right? Yeah, across, I think, you know, Nishat, um, not just digital, even, even in the analog, right? The only thing is, you know, can the digital in some way um, fasten the pace of it? Right? So uh, in other words, like, you know, um, if you look at what are the, um, I, you know, uh, if you look at Safia Noble's work also along with Radhika Gajala's, you know, algorithms of oppression, you know, what are the ways in which feminist representations are happening on the digital, on social networks or on, you know, search engines? Uh, how is that actually, does that only reflect what our societies are currently, you know, engaging with? Does it refract it? Or, you know, is it an accurate representation at all? Right. So this to me, you know, feminist studies is just one of those areas, which is something that I keep asking uh, my technocrat friends, which is that whenever we conceptualize, whether it's a search engine, uh, whether it's an algorithm, you know, can we begin by factoring in the progress, the little progress that we have made as societies, you know, so uh, why is it that, you know, uh, if in Europe, you know, every new technology or every new algorithm is designed for the white man, you know, in 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 our space, it is the you know the why uh, the upper caste male, right? Yeah, you know, so uh, can technology do? This is where I think we as DHS have to be there at the moment of that conceptualization of the technology. So we ask those questions. So, you know, one uh, talk that I gave about a year ago on Women's Day, and that day, in fact, you know, I kind of just Googled, what do women want, right? And what do men want? And, and it is hilarious. I mean, I don't know if I can pull it up fast enough, but, you know, it was like, you know, what do women want? And your drop down choices are, you know, leisure, love, care, men, you know, and uh, something else, I can't remember, uh, you know, and all of those things are probably things that we want, you know, no, no debate there. However, those were my top choices, right? And then, you know, what do men, uh, you know, men want, then, you know, the top choices are power, money, respect. And, you know, and my response is that, well, I guess I don't want any of those things, you know, <laughs> as far as Google is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> right you know so there, there is you know technology is not neutral right yeah. and this assumption that technology is neutral is just bs you know and we need to call it out uh, so i think that is the way in which you know we look at feminist studies and i also think one more thing is you know retrieving and creating uh, you know feminist narratives Right. So, you know, the 21st century equivalent of, you know, uh, retrieving, uh, for example, um, you know, diaries or memoirs, autobiographies that may never have seen the light of day because, you know, it was just some woman writing in her kitchen somewhere. Right. And those narratives, you know, I think there's work to be done there. I think Maya um, Dodd's students did an amazing project on a communal cookbook. Right. So, you know, and now you actually see a lot of women putting those cookbooks together, not just like, you know, single authored ones. I think that is another form of, I think, elit, you know, <laughs> where you have this kind of putting together of recipes, stories behind those recipes. Uh, uh, who says that that is not more important? You know, I mean, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, in 1940, uh, in the 1940s, you know, uh, Germany made the nuclear bomb and Italy made like, you know, the pasta machine. If you ask me, you know, give me the pasta machine, you know, <laughs> I think that's a better scientific <laughs> uh, invention than, uh, you know, than the bomb, right? And so, uh, so we have always, you know, hierarchized these things in masculine terms. 
And I think, you know, that also needs to be questioned. I think that was a very, that was way too long an answer, but <laughs> sorry. No, ma'am, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ma'am, just one uh, last question for you. Ma'am, in terms of when we talk about electronic literature, what is your opinion or what should we think about those uh, apps or those websites like Wattpad. I'm not if Wattpad, you're aware. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What do we think about that? Because I remember when I was a student, there were these stories and there was not just stories. They were full on novels, dramas, poetry, and all these things written. Now, many of them have been published. Many mm. of them have even been converted into movies like Netflix have taken up this, uh, you know, probably this partnership with Wattpad. So, and there were many, many Indian writers as well, you know, and there were yeah. youngsters, you know, they were yeah. youth. So they could mm. be counted as the YA adult fiction. The They were eroticas, they were romance majorly, sad. I mean, all sorts of, you know, uh, Urshairis and everything. So when we talk of electronic literature in India, do we also consider these applications? Because Wordpad is just one, which has become very famous. But then yeah. if we like do a normal search on our app stores, there would be a number of, uh, you Absolutely. know, these uh, applications. So what do we, you know, how do, what do we talk about, start talking about those things? Yeah, actually, you know, in this paper, I do talk about Wordpad, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I think Wattpad, um, uh, you know, Kelkam, yeah, these are all applications. And I think, you know, that's what I'm saying, you know, there will be a lot. And out of that will emerge some of those, you know, brilliant kind of works that will then be kind of, you know, we'll have the dissemination, right? I don't want to sound too kind of, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? uncritical? in terms of uh, quality, right? And also, I, like I said, I don't think that everything that is written on Wattpad is like, you know, great work. Uh, uh, but the fact is it's, it's, it's a democratic kind of platform. You put it out there and then, you know, the conversation happens, right? And then, you know, maybe some of those, you know, more people start engaging and then you realize, oh, okay, you know, this, this work is doing this, right? So you will see the work that are pushing boundaries and therefore, perhaps are not getting the kind of, you know, uh, responses. And then there will be works that are not doing that. In fact, they're just bad works. Let's put it like that, right? Yeah. Uh, so you, you have to have a discernment of the difference between the two. Right? And I think one example of that is one that I, I still have to watch, but, you know, I've just gotten some reviews about it is the Pavai Kadegal, you know, which is a Tamil... Uh, uh, a Netflix series that came from one of these stories about two transgender women, right? And, you know, considering that it is a topic that is not easily, uh, that's not easily, gets easy reception in our communities, that series seems to have just taken it to a different level. And you see all kinds of people kind of saying, people I would generally be suspect of, in terms of, you know, <laughs> acknowledging certain different, you know, kind of relationships, actually saying, you know, that was beautiful. Like, you know, suddenly realizing that there is this relationship that doesn't seem like, you know, in any way fake or bad or, um, you know, not right. Correct. So that means they've done something there. I still have to watch it. So I don't want to, you know, but they seem to have done something there that has brought in a lot of people who are not part of the choir to actually appreciate that story, right? And so that's that's exactly what literature is supposed to do, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for not just a fascinating presentation, but as Professor Zedi very rightly mentioned, but for your answers to the questions as well, which have added much more interesting dimensions to the discussion that has been going on here, you know, in this project. So thank you once again very much, ma'am and uh, now we have our lunch break so we'll break now for lunch for one hour but we'll be back sharp at 2 p.m for our second session of the conference so i invite you all to be present at two and see you all at two o'clock thank you so much thank you everyone thank you nishat and sorry for that a little late satellizing <laughs> presentation thank you so much thank you thanks thanks Nimala. it was yeah. fascinating i think this entire session was Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll, I'll be back at 2. Yeah. <laughs>